The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, April 16th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, John Patrick Leary on keywords, the new language of capitalism. Also on the program today, Notre Dame Cathedral suffers a colossal damage in a fire. And... Trump administration interior secretary David Bernhardt sets a new land speed record for the start of an ethics investigation launch. Records all over the place. Just four days after his confirmation. (laughs) Meanwhile, the U.S. deports a spouse of a U.S. soldier killed in Afghanistan and then reels it back in. 60 of America's biggest companies paid no federal income tax. And new documents show Facebook, surprise, surprise, lied about protecting user data privacy. Meanwhile, Bernie drank Fox's milkshake last night and dropped his taxes. It's pretty good, actually. It's pretty good. House Democrats subpoena Deutsche Bank for Trump records. And a California city does a UBI experiment. Lastly, Bill Weld makes it official. He will face Trump, who has over 85% Republican approval. Good for Bill Weld, though. Yes. Props to Bill Weld. All this and more on today's program. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, We have a lot to get to today. Crazy day. As you know, um, the Mueller report is coming out in a couple of days, and uh, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. My guess would be uh, just the moment we go on vacation would be uh, when I would predict that would happen. And in which case, I imagine there will be major revelations. And a YouTube live, maybe? What's that? Are you going to stream? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely do that. If I could get the kids to be quiet. Five seconds. Uh, meanwhile, a couple of uh, I, uh, emails we got. Um, one is from listener Stephen. This was uh, four days ago, so just just a reminder for tomorrow. It would be cool if you guys could do a brief segment on the Alberta election in Canada after 42 years of a consecutive conservative government. A modest center left party was elected, New Democratic Party, and has been attempting to bring our oil producing province with politics akin to Texas into line surpassing other Canadian provinces in social and economic policies. The leader of the UCP, the United Conservative Party, Jason Kenney, is extremely dangerous and numerous candidates in his party have had to drop out due to racist, misogynist, and homophobic views. Uh, So that uh, election is tomorrow, and that probably will be the extent of our coverage of that Alberta election. But I just wanted to mention it. Uh, we will be doing something on the big Winnipeg strike, right? Uh, on the day that that happens in May or the anniversary, I guess. Literally within the hour when it started. We're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be doing it within the hour. We're really tight. We're we are so here with the Winnipeg uh, st- uh, general strike that uh, we're gonna be almost recreating the whole thing. That's O Canada, but there you go. Uh, also, uh, this from uh, listener uh, Esme. Uh, hey, Majority Report team, just found out your your shows a couple of weeks ago and so grateful for all your work that it's the first time our household donated cash to political news. Well, thank you. Oh, wow. Hey, 
looking forward to upping our contribution when we can because uh, what you're doing is so valuable. I'm an Australian living in Rhode Island. Mm. Moved from Melbourne two years ago. And it's been tough. Sam is from Worcester, Mass., right? What advice does Sam or anyone else on team have for enduring, challenging New York, uh, New England centrism? Uh, and still also uh, and also still have friends and family. Well, the problem is uh, is Rhode Island, really. Uh, that is really the problem. I would tell you head on 146, go north to Worcester. Uh, Worcester has one of the most progressive uh, congressmen in the country, uh, Jim McGovern. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's Rhode Island is the problem. Um, is there? I can't think of any progressive leaders in Rhode Island right now. No, no. I mean, I guess the senators are decent. Sheldon Whitehouse and decent. Jack Reed, liberalish. Decent, but not, but not great. No, they're not great. Not well, great. Maybe try heading up uh, Providence or Narragansett. <laughs> there's a good little artsy community there. I don't know about the actual government and power, but there's some cool people. But yeah, yeah, there's cool people. Fun. There's there's cool people in uh, in Providence, but um, in uh, a certain Rhode sense. Island, yeah, in sort a certain of. Sense. Roger Williams. Mm. Uh, I'm a big fan of Melbourne. I saw a uh, Footscray uh, play uh, there, uh, Aussie Rules uh, Football, uh, I guess now 27 years ago. Um, all those guys who were probably playing on that team have all probably retired and passed away. So uh, that was fun. Uh, but thank you for the email. I love, uh, I love Melbourne. Love to hear from Australian people. And uh, on with the show. Last night, Bernie Sanders had a... Um, town hall on Fox and we're going to talk more about this later in the program but I think that uh, Sanders managed to do two things he managed to both and to do this almost simultaneously and we're going to play some other clips that will I think really um, uh, really uh, uh, exemplify this and I think both these things were were equally important not necessarily for his campaign but for just the 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 politics of our country. One was he was able to pitch very effectively to an audience that seemed to be sort of surprisingly excited, not just open, but excited about these policies. And two, simultaneously undercut the credibility of Fox. And uh, this was, you know, and this is no small feat. He was not... Um, Kissing their uh, their their uh, patoots, as it were, uh, but he also was was just making his pitch. I mean, I think that's probably Bernie's strength is that that he seems to do that no matter where he is, uh, frankly. But um, and you know, some people think that's you know he's sort of too mono maniacal in that respect, but quite effective in this context. Uh, here is um, <laughs> basically Brett ba uh, Bear. Um, I, I don't know what to do. Like this was, n this did not go the way that I think Fox News planned. Here's Brett Bear doing the old uh, show of hands. Let's try and intimidate Bernie, and then all of a sudden, like, if, if Brett Bear was a turtle, let's put it this way, you wouldn't see much of his face after this. People, um, this audience, this audience has a lot of Democrats in it. It has uh, Republicans, independents, Democratic Socialists, conservatives. Uh, I want to ask the audience a question, if you could raise your hand here. A show of hands of how many people get their insurance from work, private insurance, right now. How many get it from private insurance? Wow, almost okay. the whole now, room. Now, of those, how many are willing to transition to what the senator says, a government-run system? Wow. There's 180 million people on private insurance. All right, let's deal with that, Brett. And they, question. they would be lost. Pause it for right? one second. That's a smooth yeah, so transition. Now, right? I like there. He's just like, uh, ooh. Right, set up I'm not going okay. to yeah. acknowledge what the results of that were. I'm just going to. I mean, that is pretty. Do, 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 that, do. honestly, like that moment where he just like immediately pivots to like, that didn't work out. Well, uh, let's go to the other damning statistic we have that's very intimidating. I was just trying to illustrate what a non-scientific sample looks like. Right, exactly. This, of course, uh, despite my setup, like <laughs> that this was a balanced crew of everybody. It seemed to be one for one. Everybody uh, wanted to get rid of their 
their insurance. All right, so pick it up from here. And and, and they were smart. They did not cut on on Brett to his comp- the look on his that must have been on his face when he was like, "Hey," because you know. If it was like, now you've got a tough sell, Senator Sanders. You see the whole room. Uh, got to convince these you people. You got to convince these people. How are you yeah, going to do that? I don't that? know. Looking a little rough. Yeah, this is looking a little. Uh, just uh, another statistic I can throw in there, but go ahead. There's 180 million people on private insurance. All right, let's deal with that, Brett. And Fair they, question. they Brett. would be lost, right? Oh, Brett. To a, your Brett. system. Fair okay. question. Just go to face, Brett. Good, thank and you. I know it's what the right wing throws out, so let me answer it. All right? <laughs> Millions of people every single year lose their health insurance. You know why? They get fired or they quit and they go to another employer. I was the mayor for eight years. You know what I did, what probably every mayor in America does, is you look around for the best insurance program, the most cost-effective insurance. You change insurance. Every year, millions of workers wake up in the morning and their employer has changed the insurance that they have. Maybe they like the doctors. People are nodding their heads. Okay, so this is not new every year. Now, what we are talking about actually is stability, that when you have a Medicare for all, it is there now and will be there in the future. I'm not wow. even going to just mention that you got faced, Brett. But right. If you could at least give me the courtesy of debunking your tired, exhausted, stupid talking point. Uh, I mean, it's sort of really sort of stunning uh, that like you could not have you really get the sense that Brett Bear, and we're going to play more of these clips uh, later in the program, because they get, I think, like Brett and Martha, uh, and I can't remember her last name, uh, McCollum. McCollum, get increasingly more frustrated, I think, as the evening is going on, because it, it is not going well for them, and there's no way, when they head back to the commissary today, and they're in line at lunch, and everybody gathers around the commissary at Fox... They're going to, their people are going to be giving them sideways looks. Well, what's funny, what I found funny about uh, good that. Good job, Martha. <laughs> what I found you funny about that, that particular one. dynamic is that it was more frustrating, I think, for Brett because he still needs to maintain the semblance of being a straight reporter. And Martha was more willing to just be like, oh, this isn't going bad. So let me like turn the guns on a little right. bit because she's a little bit more on the overt opinion side. I mean, they both failed, but I think Brett's tension of like, is absolutely not going the way it's supposed to, but I'm supposed to also pretend right, that I'm that I okay care, with it. That I don't care, right. That little laugh he did after Bernie's like, I know that's what the right wing's throwing out. He's like, ha, ha. you know he wants to be like, oh, you suck. Well, I, I, I uh, would put the chances, and it's now 12, 15 off, p.m. Man. Eastern, I would put the chances of of Hannity going up to Brett Bear right now in line at the commissary and like just going, looking at him and just taking his, like, uh, you know, whatever. He's got the rice pudding he probably pulled from the commissary thing, and he's just taking it and he's just going good job so mad and here uh here is donald trump in like this is one of those things where you just like oh the tweet itself is not that crazy and then you realize like it's insane that the president of the united states is writing this and he writes so weird to watch crazy bernie on fox news not surprisingly brett bear and the audience in quotes was so smiley and nice very strange and now we have Donna Brazil? What? Question mark? <laughs> so. It makes sense. Like, I can't handle it. I've got, like, my show, and I'm used to not watching in Fox and see. And, th- I mean, it does. He's, he's, I can't tell if he is tweeting this as an audience member or if when he says, and now we have Donna Brazil, if he's talking about, like, as a member of the administration of Fox. I feel like it's viewer. I, I see himself as like a view. I think he sees himself as a viewer who gets to have input. I'm a man of the people. So, I'm just a regular Fox News viewer. I'm not but, pulling rank. So I, I, I didn't watch it, but Donna Brazil did not make an appearance on the program last night. No, no. This is a completely. This is this is him trying to this this. I, I mean, if you really start to think about it, this is and I don't know if he does this consciously or not, but this really. Um, I, what he is surprising, what he's surprised about, and he's saying not surprisingly, but what he's surprised about is how well Bernie did here. Because he, the implication is that the Fox, Fox is getting soft, right? That they were too smiley and nice, Brett Bear was, and the audience was too yeah, nice. The refs were really letting them get away with everything. The fact that, it, the fact that they now have Donna Brazil on there shows how soft Fox is getting and that they're actually... What he's basically saying is Fox is rigged. 
And Fox is totally rigged. They could have called him a crazy Jew, Shylock Bernie. I'm going to watch MSNBC black now. Lesbian? Can I'm going to watch MSNBC now. They're the only ones that treat Bernie fair. <laughs> hey, uh, folks, uh, when I go on, uh, on television, you know uh, the one thing that you can count on, and that is that I have shaved with my Harry's razor. Why is that? Well, uh, for me, I think people know why I love Harry's. Uh, from a utilitarian perspective, the narrowness of the blade uh, has been a big upshot for me. Um, someone uh, friends with me uh, most, uh, most recently uh, just recognized that I have asymmetry in my nostrils, uh, which I try and keep on the down low, but uh, I do. Uh, just you know, someone who was looking up my nose, and uh, and and so uh, they now appreciate the value that I place on the narrowness of the um, of the Harry's razor head. The other thing that I like too is the um, is the handle. It's just it's very sort of like classic lines and uh, not you know I don't feel like I'm all buffy like R Rambo. With the uh, the ones that you get, you know what I'm talking about, like the 14 different treads. GI Joe. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, the really, really elaborate ones. Yeah. And uh, Harry's founders were were tired of paying up for razors that were overpriced and overdesigned. They knew a great shave didn't come from gimmicks like vibrating heads or flex balls, or handles that look like spaceships. That's my point. Uh, so they bought world class blade factory in Germany, started making razors that combine simple, clean design with quality, durable razors at a fair price. A Harry's replacement cartridge costs two bucks. And all Harry's blades come with a 100% guarantee. Uh, they've gotten over 20,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google. Now you can get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. The weighted ergonomic handle I spoke of earlier, the five-blade razor with a lubricating strip, and trimmer blade we call the Sam blade around here. We don't really. Uh, rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash majority report. Make sure you go to harrys.com slash majority report to redeem your offer and let them know I sent you to help support the show. Speaking of uh, supporting the show, one of today's sponsors is Skillshare. Now, anyone who goes to skl.sh slash majority report two is going to get two whole months free in use of Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online community that offers courses on everything from design to video editing, photography, business, technology, cooking, uh, meditation, everything in between. There are skills, uh, scare, uh, skill, uh, Skillshare courses for everyone. You'll have no problem finding courses that'll be useful for you both in your personal life and in your professional life. Uh, whether you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or whether you want to learn how to do something totally new, Skillshare has you covered. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, learning new languages, Photoshop, you name it. You can check out going freelance, building uh, and branding your own success, uh, or how to do presentations, how to use, um, you know, uh, Photoshop or or others. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. Let me let's see what do we got for writing here: storytelling, character conflict, context and craft, writing characters, creative personal writing. There's tons of this stuff. You can get two entire months free. You'll have access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority report two. Just think of everything you're going to have at your fingertips for two whole months free. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report two. I put a link underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. And of course, we put all the uh, links in our podcast uh, uh, audio description as well. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to be talking to John Patrick Leary on keywords, the new language of capitalism.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Just a reminder, you can support this show by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. You get the uh, free show, and then we give you extra content every day on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program English professor at Wayne State University and author of Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism, John Patrick Leary. John, uh, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Um, so this is, I, I, I really enjoy this book and these type of um, uh, 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 approaches to sort of making us more conscious of the way that we, we speak and what the implications are. Uh, but before we sort of dig into some of the, uh, the words here um, and that, you, that you examine in the book, let's just start with the way that you define, because you, these are words that um, have been, I guess, I'm not sure how to phrase this, brought to us by late-stage capitalism, but what does, what does late-stage capitalism mean to you? <laughs> and you're starting with the uh, tough ones right, a while, right off the bat. Huh? Um, well, you know, basically it means the latest form of capitalism. I think that's the best and most concise definition that uh, I know, which is to say, on the one hand, it is characterized by a lot of, um, by a, a particular vocabulary of, of uh, rebellion, of artistry, of individualism, of um, individual possibility through the market. And so that is what gives um, rise to something as peculiar in historical context as like the creative creative capitalism or the creative class. Um, but on the other hand, it also implies that uh, this is merely a new twist on something very old. And so that's one of the... Um, points that I uh, like to really emphasize about this book is that, um, you know, the, our, our current economic vocabulary is really big on constantly celebrating novelty, you know, constantly celebrating innovation and so forth. And um, the point is that a lot of our, um, a lot of what passes for novelty in our, in our world is, is just slightly different forms of the old forms of exploitation. And so it's the latest form of something old. It's a new twist on an old story. Uh, you know, the, it, it's interesting you, you, you say that because I think, you know, uh, Corey Robin, uh, Robin's um, uh, definition of, of reactionaryism is, is, is very similar to that. The idea that you're sort of repackaging um, the, uh, and maybe not so much in terms of um, uh, uh, capitalism per se, but you're repackaging uh, the sort of pre-existing and the long-time existing uh, power dynamics and uh, making them cool and seem rebellious in some fashion. Yeah, and a lot of, in, in the story I'm kind of telling in some of these words, and innovation is, is a particularly good example, um, they come about sometimes in, in deliberate ways, sometimes sort of organically, but um, as, as ways of responding to old critiques of of capitalism. So in the, you know, in the depression in the 1930s and forties, the, um, the, and then in the post-war period, the idea of big business was something really toxic in American culture. Big business was seen as with great suspicion and the life of a businessman was seen as a, a kind of a life of conformity. You know, the, this is like the organization man idea. And so innovation becomes a way of sort of celebrating, um, the idea of personal liberation and personal fulfillment through trudging off to the office every day. And that's a kind of um, phenomenon that I think is, uh, that is very much with us now, but its origins are, you know, about half a century ago. Is there, I mean, is that, and, 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 you know, I want to get into some of the specifics of the words again, but, um, but, but staying sort of like um, uh, just a little bit, uh, uh, 10,000 feet, is there, is there a, are, are, can you organize the development of these words or I guess like the um, not so much the development, but the adoption and the, the, the frequency of use of these words? Are there different ways? Are, are, are there, you know, uh, main categories of the ways in which these happen? Are they, for instance, are they 
to serve in the same function that you were just talking about. Like, um, I mean, for instance, you know, I just got back from a trial lawyer conference and they don't necessarily call themselves trial lawyers anymore because trial lawyers got uh, maligned. So they refer to themselves sometimes as plaintiff attorneys. And um, and so we see this, you know, development uh, happen when, like you say, uh, there, there's a perspective that, you know, being been part of a big business is, is seen as being ossified, so we come up with the word innovation. Is that is that the way that these words um, uh, enter into the lexicon, or is it? Uh, are there other roots as well? Well, I'd say that's most of them function in kind of that way. They don't always have a, a particular author, or you know, there's not necessarily one guy who thought of um, saying innovation all the time, you know. But they do function in a way to as substitutes or as evasions for what we're really talking about. So the, one, one of the best examples is human capital, which I talk about in the book, which is really just um, a way of saying labor without talking about, without using that, that dirty word, uh, if you're an economist. And so um, it's a way of um, talking about something that might be characterized by, you know, exploitation or uh, mistreatment, um, as being a resource and not just as a resource, but as a resource for your own self, you know, your, your work is your own human capital. You're not, um, beholden to a boss in that kind of imagination. So it's a way of talking about work without talking about, um, inequality or, uh, exploitation at work. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the, the sort of the categories here of, uh, that, that you, you break it down to, um, one is, uh, late capitalist body talk. And we sh I should just tell people that the the contents, um, like the, I guess, the chapters of your book, I guess, um, are, it's really just a list of, you know, you have a list of, I guess, about 30 some odd words uh, that you um, uh, develop the, the, the thesis around. So let's let's just talk about late capitalist uh, body talk. What's a good example of a uh, of body talk in that respect? Well, nimble is a good one. So nimble is a word that is used in um, mainstream journalism and in financial business journalism to describe corporations that have shed labor costs, basically, or other <laughs> operating costs. So a nimble corporation is one that um, can move very quickly and can leap and is spry and mobile, and it calls to mind. You know, the word. The, I think most people's association, at least English speakers' association with the word nimble, is you know the uh, nursery rhyme, Jack jumping, you know, Jack jump, jumping over the candlestick, and it's a word that Jack be nimble, a, Jack be quick. Right. Okay. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so it's a word that used to, um, if you search it in you know, newspaper archives, it used to only appear in the sports section because it would describe like a nimble shortstop or something. And then it became a word used to describe corporations, which is now like mostly where you find it in, um, in, in journalism. And so it's a, again, like human capital, it's a way of, of talking about work without talking about workers, basically. And then uh, flexible is another um, is another one, and unlike nimble, flexible is used to describe workers. But again, it's used to describe increasingly onerous work schedules in which you have to be ready to appear at your job at the mall or at Starbucks or something at a different time every day. You know, you have a flexible schedule, but instead of describing that as extremely difficult and painful and um, disruptive to your daily life and to your family life and so forth, it uh, frames it as if it's like a... Like a um, positive. Like a positive, yes, a positive attribute. So, I mean, people could say like, oh, yeah, no, I've got an inconsistent schedule as opposed to I'm on a flexible schedule. That yeah, has right. very different uh, connotations as to who is bearing the burden of that uh, that schedule, right? I mean, it's just sort yeah. of uh, the idea is that yeah, no, I have uh, my schedule is flexible, but in fact, it's not the schedule that is a that is actually flexible. It is the human who is being asked to be flexible. Yeah, and if you think about if you follow that metaphor a little bit further, then you're talking about people being 
bent and contorted in all kinds of different di painful directions. But, you know, we usually don't get that far when we're talking about a flexible work or, or, or a flexible work schedule. And, 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 and to be clear, like this is language that just sort of sticks, right? Like people find, I mean, I, people find that as they, you know, someone just threw this out in what, in, in one conversation, it seems like, or maybe somebody wrote a, um, uh, an HR, uh, you know, newsletter saying we're going to ask for more, you know, for a flexible schedule. And then everybody just found that a comfortable way to refer to what they were asking of their workers. Right. I mean, is that basically the way this stuff develops? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's hard to trace the, uh, the way some of these terms develop. And I mean, I think that's what's sort of interesting about them. And that's what makes them um, keywords is that they are, they kind of diagnose a collective or conventional wisdom or conventional stupidity as the case often is. But it's a, it's not something that um, a, like a, an evil genius developed or invented at some particular moment. It's, um, it's something that expresses, you know, the way that we talk about, uh, our lives under, um, you know, late stage capitalism. And so it's, it's a good way I think of diagnosing some of the, the ways of thinking that have become conventional. Um, let's talk about the, the moral vocabulary, uh, of late, uh, capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. wh what is, wh give us a couple examples of those. Well, uh, innovation is one. I mean, innovation has a has a kind of strange and long history uh, as a religious word. For the longest time, it was a term that was synonymous with a with false prophecy. So to innovate was to um, was to improvise upon the word the word of God in a way that um, a, a, a human wasn't allowed to do. So if you're an innovator, you were a false prophet or you were a conspirator or a heretic or something. And then it became um, kind of secularized in the 20th century and became you know, applied in the way we kind of recognize it now towards some particular task, uh, you know, a new, uh, like a new way of manufacturing a thing or distributing a thing. But it still retains that air of prophecy, I think, when we hear it used to describe, you know, great innovators or innovations in some particular firm. Um, because it's so, it's so rarely used to describe any actual recognizable object or thing. It's just a sort of a spirit that a successful person um, has within them. So it's kind of a moral quality. And passion is another one. Um, that connotes some kind of innate moral capacity that's supposed to serve you well at work, um, but often is, you know, kind of like flexible, is a way of um, making your poorly compensated devotion seem like a um, seem like your life's work rather than something you should be paid for. So we always hear teachers described as passionate, or um, you know, people who take care of the elderly at home are passionate about their work. Um, and we call, we talk, passion is sort of a substitute for um, a living wage. Right. <laughs> it's <Why> a, <laughs> passionate. When we say they're passionate, we're saying they're underpaid and they don't seem to mind. Yeah. 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 They take home passion dividends instead of, um, instead of um, high wages. They would like a vacation, but instead we gave them the opportunity to do something that they seem to like. So that's basically right. I mean, that seems what it like. That's that seems to be what uh, that that word means. An innovator is to me, seems to me to be also someone who's like a rebel. Right. Which also yeah. implies yeah. that on some level that like they have a certain level of freedom that exists there. Right. That they're not bound by um, by by sort of, I guess, they're not encumbered by by what they're doing as opposed to, I guess. I mean, I'm trying to think of like the. They're rebels as opposed to people who've just found a way to sort of like pay people less in some way. I don't know. I think of like like all the 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 gig economy stuff is sort of like it's a it's a it's a new innovation. We found how to get human beings to uh, function with just a lot less calories or something like that. <laughs> yes. Or, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever people figured out how to do um, that caused the economy to crash in 2007 2008 those that was some innovative work too but because we also describe innovation 
only in ever, only in positive terms. You know, it's only it's it's synonymous with improvement. Um, we that's another factor in its peculiar moral sense. But I, the point about rebellion is 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 a good one, and it's part of innovation's earlier history because it you know it was originally to to be an innovator was to be a rebel in, in a in a in a in a bad sense, but now it's the opposite. And creativity is another word that has that same that same kind of history. So you know where once we might have thought of creative types as being unorthodox or um, you know they sleep late they don't like to go to work um, now those kinds of attributes of idiosyncrasy or um, peculiarity or rebelliousness are kind of harvested by um, by by corporations and business schools as being like the stuff of real successful people. Right. And there's another uh, aspect of the type of words, uh, like sort of where the, where, um, the, where there's, um, there's a co-opting of, uh, of sort of, I don't want to say counterculture, but non business cultures, right? Like when it, uh, like uh, we give us an example of that dynamic. So besides creativity, uh, the uh, the artisan is a good example. Um, you know, the artisan is somebody who pursues some kind of craft uh, passionately, to use another word, and is interested in doing so because of some devotion, you know, not to the profit motive necessarily, but to, um, you know, like an intimate attachment to to carpentry or to food or to some or to some other kinds of um, particular kind of object or business and so the um, originally you know the artisan was somebody who was sort of displaced by capitalist production you know the artisan who made a particular kind of chair was put out of work and had to go work in the assembly line making um, making cheaper chairs but the way that the word has gotten kind of absorbed into, you know, like high-end consumer culture now is a way of imbuing, um, you know, manufactured goods and uh, manufactured food products with some of this era of authenticity that is thought, you know, has long been thought to be lost in, in mass production. So that's another example of the, the artistry thing. Like, is, is that like like craft beer and just sort of, I guess... Um, I mean, I, I, and to some extent, I would say a lot of, I've, I mean, I noticed in the context of, of our advertisers on these programs uh, that we, uh, we do here that there's that quality of like, we're going to let um, people know, you know, the, we're going to put the founders sort of forward and, and make it just seem like it's, you know, it's two guys and maybe it starts with just two guys or two, two girls, but it, there's yeah. that whole quality of like, we're just regular people. Yeah, and it usually is, I think, two guys in those cases. I mean, maker is a kind of a similar word to um, artisan, uh, but all these kind of words that describe some kind of tinkering um, and and careful uh, devotion to a craft are all very gendered words. So, you know, a maker is someone who like knows how to do stuff with 3D printers and high tech high technology. Kind of stuff, and that's usually you know a, um, that's like usually pictured as a male figure, and it's valued now, and so does artisan. But crafting, you know, is kind of similar to those words, but it's never had the sort of prestige of of making or artisanship because crafting is something women do, you know, and it's something that you do at home. It's not something that um, is celebrated as uh, in the in the broader economy. Uh, you also have um, a, a category of words that um, uh, pushes the notion of, of new technologies. Um, mm -hmm. What words would those be? So data, smart, um, solution, solutions, um, innovation again. I mean, innovation is kind of, um, in all of the categories, it's kind of the uh, the er word of the of the book, but... Smart is is a word that got its start, um, you know, in the military, 
the smart bomb, I think, is the way I first encountered the word used in a as a as a way of describing technology. Um, and the smart the smart bomb was originally called the um, a hobo in the Vietnam War, which was a sort of a portmanteau of homing bomb. And then oh. they kind of, they rebranded they rebranded it as a smart bomb. Uh, which is probably a smart move on their part. And now it describes, you know, any kind of technology that is thought to have, uh, on the one hand, thought to have an intelligence of its own, but really what that means is that it's thought to be kind of linked to our own intelligence or our own desires. And so, you know, the smart refrigerator, which knows when we need to buy more milk, or the, the smart bed that knows just how puff, you know, fluffy you like your mattress to be. I want to talk about a couple other words here, too, that I, I sort of, um, I've probably interviewed um, over the years two or three people who have grit in the title of their book. Um, <laughs> what is that? But but I, and some, I think, are in the context in which you're talking about, but there is there is a quality to it that always, um, well, uh, that always, I think, uh, stuck in my craw a little bit. What, what, give us the word grit. What are the implications of that word? Well, grit is another example of a word that is both very much of our time and very old as well because it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of version of a, of a story that uh, goes back to Horatio Alger and the celebration of the what he often called pluck, but he also called it grit of working class youth who have to pull themselves up through their own ingenuity and their own cleverness. And these were sort of supposed to be lessons to, to, to wealthy soft kids. And the way grit is used now is to celebrate what its principal theorist calls uh, the combination of passion and um, intelligence. So passion and devotion to a particular job. So if you have grit, you are um, passionate about the work you're doing. You have the strength to overcome challenges. And if you don't have grit, you'll succumb to those challenges. So what's to me what's pernicious about the word, and especially in the way that it's used, it's preached to poor children – uh, or working class children in the United States, because it's an educational value, I think, above all, um, is that it says, well, if you, uh, it says to you that you can overcome any obstacle, that nothing is impossible for you if you have grit. Um, but if you fail to accomplish your, your career goals, or if you fa fail to accomplish whatever your goals are, then that must suggest that you didn't have grit. And so it's a way of explaining away the inequality of the systems we have rather than a way of um, attempting to transform them. That's the major problem with it. And is there and, and can you develop grit? Is that the big thing you, you can? Yeah, you, you can develop grit, but that's it's a supposedly an optimistic idea. Yes, uh, it's it's not something that you're born with. I mean, that's the way. Right. That because you can't be bo if you were born with it, it would ru it would undercut the real value of grit, which is that. It's available to anybody if, but, but it's like, it's sort of like there are multiple layers, right, of moral righteousness that are involved mm -hmm. here. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can acquire grit, so society is equal, but you just, it's not so much that you're in a position to acquire grit. It's just a question if you are morally righteous enough to go after grit. And then once you get grit, you can use the grit to achieve stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but it, but I think it's, you know, I think it uh, is so unfair to people um, who are in a position where um, they need to be grittier than the next kid uh, to to say that if you, uh, you know, if if something goes wrong, it must have been your fault because you you weren't gritty enough or you didn't develop grit in the proper way. So, you know, like, again, it doesn't, it doesn't actually propose to transform the systems we have. It just, it offers people this, I think, fantasy that they can um, make their own way within it. But if everybody was equally gritty, then, you know, 
then we would have the exact same situation we have when if nobody had any grit, right? Which is just that like it's great to have grit, but it's much easier if your dad owns a newspaper, let's say, or a major broadcasting company or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, so if everybody was equally gritty, then we just need to be even grittier. And then <laughs> it, the the grit arms race would just go on forever. And it also feels like it's something that you, it, it's even, and, and we should talk about maybe meritocracy as well. But grit is, it seems to be, to be even more of a nebulous term than meritocracy, than the merit, mm-hmm. right? Like merit almost feels like you could measure, but grit seems impossible to measure. Like if you just had 25% more grit, you would have overcome the fact that, um, you know, you, um, you were not a legacy uh, admissions to, um, uh, to Yale or something like that. 25% more grit plus the fact that you went to uh, a state school would have gotten to you where that guy who got into Yale was. You can't make that measurement at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, Angela Duckworth, the psychologist who's most associated with the word, uh, I think does claim to have a metric for it, but uh, it doesn't make sense to me. And I, you know, I agree. It's like, it's such a moral characteristic um, that the idea of measuring it not only seems impossible, but also just cruel. um, If you, if you, even if you could. Um, Talk about meritocracy. Meritocracy is a word that began its life as a mockery of the idea of meritocracy. <laughs> so basically it was coined um, by a British writer to, by a British sociologist to, to make fun of the idea that um, in Britain that uh, old class inequalities and old, old class allegiances were being uh, phased out in, in, um, and, and that people's success was now contingent on their education. So the idea, the joke of the word was that it was a combination of merit, the thing you supposedly get at school, and aristocracy, the thing that you're born with. Um, and what he, was, what he was saying is that Britain was simply replacing an inherited system of privilege with a system of privilege that you got access to through your access to elite educational institutions. So it was a way of um, kind of reframing inherited privilege and granting it the veneer of um, democracy, basically. It's basically a surrogate for inherited uh, privilege. But yeah, seems... instead of just being born with it, you're born with the idea that you're born able to go to Oxford, and, um, and that's how you... Um, that's how you ascend to wealth and privilege. I should say, that and, I also, my understanding is that the, the saying, uh, pull yourself up by the boots, uh, bootstraps, and I guess bootstrapping is one of those terms now, that too was introduced as a satire. That oh, pe- was it my understanding is that the, the introduction of pull yourself up by the bootstraps was mocking people who were saying that you could do that because it's physically impossible to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> yeah, and I've often thought about if you actually did, you would just sort of flip over and land on your head. Right. So, yeah, so it makes sense as a joke better, more than it makes sense as, a, as an actual... And then somehow it got adopted. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's strange. And it, it speaks, I think, in part to um, just the... Kind of cravenness of um, a lot of our discourse of business and and um, and the way we talk about class and the way we talk about business and the way we talk about uh, inequality uh, is that there you know there's a, a just r- real kind of sometimes shameless desire to uh, reframe any kind of inequality or unfairness as somehow um, this is actually just a way of of uh, transcending your limitations, you know? So like meritocracy got adopted by the Blair government really enthusiastically in Britain in the nineties to celebrate the very thing that it was intended to criticize in the first place, to celebrate the, the idea that um, the government, the country would be run by people, by the smartest people, the people who got the best grades, who went to the best schools 
Um, and at no point, I, apparently, did anybody reflect on the fact that the ability to get the best grades and goes to the best schools was a reflection of all kinds of inherited privileges and um, and inequalities. Do you think there is a, you know, when I look at some of these words, I mean, I, I wonder if there isn't a, um, uh, a, a desire to accept these, I guess, the implications of these words by people who are not using them in a cynical fashion, right? Like the, the, like it's really attractive to believe that there's a meritocracy and it's really attractive that you could be able to pull your, your, um, your, yourself up by your own boots, uh, because that would imply like, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a force that is accessible to me that actually can defeat gravity or physics. Like, I mean, you know, like it, it, there, there's a hopeful quality to these things. And that seems to be, you know, whether it's like, you know, uh, life hacks or, um, you know, uh, uh, well, all the smart stuff and, uh, you know, uh, pivoting and, and all of these, uh, mm -hmm. these things imply even a marketplace, right? Because we, I can go into a market and I can get, uh, stuff. Um, I mean, yes. the, there, there's all, it all seems to be on some level, you know, providing hope where they're really, where we're in some respects, these words are telling us that like things are already predetermined, but you can still contemplate the idea that you could change it. Yeah, I think that's precisely what most of them do, and that's what most of them are intended to do. I mean, grit is a really good example, again, because um, it's explicitly designed, I mean, this is how Duckworth talks about it in her book, to counter the idea of genius. So she begins the book by talking about how she got a genius grant, but, uh, you know, one of those MacArthur genius grants. But how she didn't like being called a genius because genius is suggests that you're you know, you're born with it or something, and so grit is about you know again it's about like transcending these ideas about um, people who are just destined to be good and people who are just destined to be failures by saying that we can all do it if we get grit, um, and you know like to use another one of our popular metaphors, when you said define gravity, it made me think of it you know climbing the ladder of opportunity. Um, you know, there's a ladder has rungs at the bottom and has rungs at the top. So if you're, if, if we're all climbing the ladder of opportunity, someone's at the bottom, you know, if we're not all, we can't all be at the top of the ladder or the ladder would fall over. And so these kinds of ideas of, um, mobility that we get in concepts like grit and that we get in, uh, concepts like flexibility uh, empowerment, choice, all of which I, you know, I talk about in the book, um, are all about reframing kind of increasingly onerous obligations, increasingly um, exhausting and poorly compensated work, increasingly um, bleak options we have in, say, a public school system um, as opportunities as things we should be grateful for. And so what is the, 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 the totality of it? What is, what is problematic in a broad sense of this? Like, you know, how does, how does this language in its totality, um, inhibit progress? Well, I mean, I think first of all, just it celebrates competition, um, above as, as just like the ultimate value above all else and you know in um, grit is a you know to come back to grit you know children are all supposed to be competing with each other to get ahead to like elbow out the the, the kid who's not gritty enough um and that's a kind of distressing and depressing idea of what you know a, what a grade school education is supposed to be about um entrepreneurship is again all about the zeal to elbow out your competition to win, uh, to uh, accumulate more, and it it celebrates that as just a kind of uh, deep intrinsic value, you know, where 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 we might think about things like I don't know, um, cooperation or solidarity or old fashioned things like that as being um, as as being more valuable, you know, but. 
the ways that these these words all kind of they normalize competition, they camouflage exploitation, and so they inhibit. I think ultimately they kind of inhibit our inhibit our political and um, and cultural imagination. That's good a place as any uh, to stop. Uh, John Patrick Leary, the book is Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism, a really uh, fascinating book. I really appreciate your time today. Well, thanks a lot for having me. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the fun half, wherein we will uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Bernie Sanders uh, at Fox and Eric uh, Swalwell, uh, Swalwell's bold new idea on how to um, salvage the uh, country. Here is a clue. It involves no red states and no blue states. And just uh, coming together with a, uh, a cabinet of, um, what does he call it? A cabinet? Team of rivals. Team of rivals. Yes. Where, yeah. did I, where have I heard that before? Gosh, that's not even that good of a book. No, but it, but that was what Obama. <laughs> yeah, no. Lincoln, it. white boy. Doris Kearns, good one. Yeah. Oh, my God. God. Um, we will also hear from uh, a whole, we got uh, Glenn Beck. I, I don't know if people uh, caught this, but when I was talking about, when I was in Las Vegas at the, um, at the uh, lawyers conference, I look up and I see a dude I know who used to have a show on the Blaze Network. He is a, he was a comedian. He's a comedian. He's a very uh, uh, funny guy, actually. Uh, but a little bit libertarian leaning. He's not. He's not like a Glenn Beckish. Um, but I think the the uh, getting involved in legal cases and hearing about the hot coffee, getting into that, I think is starting to like wear him down a little bit. It was a little bit rough for him to. But then we had uh, dinner one night, and then you know things got went a little sideways. Whenever I started eating and drinking, you went on an ice cream bender. We know. I know <laughs> the chis gelato is so good. Too many. You're more. wrong about Social Security. Mmm, that's delicious. I mean, Can I have it more. Was almost exactly that, except for it was <laughs> not Social Security. We were having a big argument. That isn't how the legal system big, works. Ooh, try the pistachio. That it, it was. <laughs> It was it was actually very similar to that, um, and I, but I got you know at one point you hit 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 a point where you're like oh I forgot, I forgot this is what this is what his politics are about. I forgot your yeah. thoughts. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, uh, but um, oh we we're going to be talking Glenn Beck maybe in the uh, fun half. Uh, just a reminder, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. dot com. When you do, you're not only supporting the free show, we're giving you extra content every day. Are we giving a doing over the vacation? Have we picked out any stuff? We should maybe pick out some stuff, some deep vault stuff. Do you want to take a look in the deep vault again, Brendan? You guys thought you were going to get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> look at look at it, look it. Oh, my God. It's true. He really looks like he wants to. They're really... <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe we'll do two idea. or three, two in or three shows. Two or three, two or three of the default stuff. This guy wrote stuff. one episode of that's, Chappelle show. It's not. It's it's absolutely not. That's not the issue. Is the original, um, the one you did on the best show, is that audio? Do we have that audio available? We do have that audio available. That might be a good one to put on there. I haven't, I haven't actually heard that, that myself. Good. Have that's, you not? That's no. Very oh, I got to find that because he pulled it down. Because I think a lot of people were 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 pulling it down at one point. And so that was one of the few things that he, I don't know, the years ago that he didn't have that he pulled down for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a request in the Discord for my show, which was very funny. I don't know. Was it this year where we did the bit that the Bush family are all shape shifting reptiles? That was except, 2016. Oh, okay, except Jeb can't shape shift. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> <Yes. request? laughs> Aww, <laughs> George classic. just like, hey guys, we're play Scrapple tonight. And George W's just like, how I about we turn into lizard. hawks and fly? <laughs> come on, come on in, guys. Oh, sorry, Jeb. Oops, sorry, Jeb. Oops, sorry, Jeb. You guess, guess you're gonna stay home. Oh, I guess Jeb's gonna stay on that rock while the rest of us uh, swim around with our fins. 
But uh, what, how would we even find that? No. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jeff. I mean, we can pull. We can't do I didn't put activity. anything into the. Anyways, except for uh, massage, Bob, Bob. The point being <laughs> that um, for just uh, pennies a day, uh, you can have access to all of that great content. Like uh, God, you may have missed the. The Bush family shapeshifter make fun of Jeb segment that we did. <laughs> Such a good. Thing. That was a that golden was a era. Bit. That was, that was making fun of Jeb Bush. In the same way that making fun of Jeb Bush propelled Donald Trump. Right. It also exactly. propelled the majority. Report. That's right. And then, of course, it all yes, didn't work out so well. So. And it wasn't quite so funny anymore no. to make fun of Barbara molesting Jeb or them not being able to shapeshift. You remember, right. you remember when George W. said, I remember this is another classic line, one of, one of your lines, when you said, <laughs> This is beanbag. How, how George W. walks in on Jeb massaging Barbara's bunions or something like that. And he's just like, Sorry, Mom, I've got my old girlfriend now. <laughs> Jeb's oh, a loser. Real mother boy hours. <laughs> yes. Oh. So it's uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, folks, you have uh, two weeks left in the month of April in which to go to justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. And uh, you don't even need to use the coupon code MAJORITY. You will get 30% off your coffee. Great opportunity for you to try all the different types of coffees they have at Just Coffee and uh, check it out. Then you can just uh, order on a regular basis of the the key is in this uh, time is to go and you get a bunch of like uh, the one pound bags, try a bunch of different coffees, see which ones you like. If you don't like one, you re-gift it to somebody and then uh, you buy that one uh, over and over again. Uh, today is Tuesday. Oh, my gosh. Look at you, Michael. What's uh, what's happening tonight? It's happening tonight. Is oh, is that why you're not wearing a track suit? Because you're doing oh, no, I'll show? be in a full suit tonight. I'll be. Yeah. I'll be attired in a suit suit. Is that what you do? This you... is the this is the intermediary stage. Oh, I see. Okay. Proper shirt on Thursday, then usually on Tuesday during the day. Track suit. Rest you had track week. suit on Thursday last week, I think. Wow. Or wait, one of the. Oh days. yeah, you're right. I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> Nike track suit. It's starting to bleed into your whole dope. like all the time. I'm not mad at it. I like the track suit. Well, let me just give you a piece of advice. I'm not going to You're going to look back. You're going to look back on this and it's going to be I regretful for you. Absolutely not going to take fashion advice from I, you. You don't have to. Yeah, that's okay. I'm uh, Let's I'm communicating the other. It's not just me. <laughs> I wouldn't know. To me, I'm like, yeah, track suit all the time. Oh, of course. You, oh really? Uh, many people are saying, huh? Yeah, there's a lot of people saying. I mean, it's all right. Lots of people. I'm I'm just aware of regret. I'm not specifically in terms of fashion. I just know how regret works. I'll regret when I wear the Eddie Murphy delirious suit. Yeah, you may that have already. I feel like you're sort of no, spiraling I, a little bit, but go I, ahead. I, not quite there yet, but I'm working up towards it. Tonight, Professor Richard Wolf returns. We're going to be talking about UBI, Gramsci, hegemony, uh, and then, of course, you know, Bernie uh, at Fox News and uh, a bunch of other things. We're live at 7 p.m. Uh, tonight, Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. We are uh, tickets from being sold out to the Saturday live show. So if you want it, come to LA uh, April uh, this Saturday at the Bootleg Theater with the team and Anna Kasparian, Big Waz, and Nando Vila. Patreon.com slash TMBS for the whole thing. And obviously, we uh, the reason we doubled up this week is we will not have a, li uh, a live regular scheduled show next week because we're on vacation, but we'll have a bunch of new clips and uh, all of the usual Patreon uh, shows as well. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, we got out of the studio and went to the Socialism in Our Time conference which was a joint venture between historical materialism and Jacobin. And we did some interviews on the fly. So uh, Sean's still editing it together right now. I'm not sure 100% what's going to make the final cut, but we've got stuff on uh, Marxist analysis of gaming, unionizing the marginal in the UK, uh, the ways that the family unit has changed under capitalism and openings to build something better. Um, and also... A little interview on the situation in Venezuela with the great George Chicarello Mar. So check it out. Oh, that's dope. Thank you. We're going to want to hear that. 
Um, yeah, Matt. Literary Hangover, check out the Oscar Wilde episode if you haven't and you want uh, ammunition to respond to the uh, trolling about Bernie's charitable spending. Uh, Oscar Wilde was already on the train that uh, philanthropy is a joke and what you really need to do is abolish private property. So uh, check that episode out, folks. Oh, uh, Risk is going to be on right before you guys. What? On Saturday, April 20th? Right before your show. Risk? Yeah. Which one's um, he's, uh Risk is a, um, is Wait. a podcast. Oh, Kevin Allison? Yeah. That's so funny. I didn't, you know, because Kevin Allison actually was at the TMBS uh, Bell House show. Yeah, no, he's a fan of uh, both our shows. Yeah, Kevin's awesome. I didn't realize the timing on that. That's cool. That show is about people like tell like a story they've never told publicly before. Right. It's actually really interesting. Kevin's a really cool guy. Former uh, member of the state. That was an MTV show, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, do I feel old? All right, folks. I see, wasn't even trying to make see, you feel I know, that way on that. I know. One. That's why it made that's what would really hurt. See you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice to Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil... Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. But Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. All right, we're back. It's the fun half of the Majority Report, ladies and gentlemen. Firing up the I Am machine. Uh, let's first go to... The um, Fox News uh, Bernie Town Hall. Uh, play a couple of clips from there. This is um, it's clip number three, where we had mentioned earlier that Brett Baer had to sort of maintain some semblance of being the straight news guy. And so uh, I am not going to feel quite as humiliated 
when I take a survey of the audience and find that everything I've been promoting on Fox News for over a decade is not popular with the people who are here for some reason. Um, now, this was done. This town hall was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, I don't I, I mean. If you had told me that this was done at uh, the auditorium at the University of Vermont and uh, that I would have been like, oh, that makes sense. But this audience, I don't know if Fox News doesn't have a lot of attention, but th this audience seemed to be incredibly amenable to uh, Bernie Sanders and his policies, which theoretically have been maligned on Fox News for ages. And here, Martha McCallum, and I think this is getting towards the end of the um, of the thing where there's. I, th I think these two hosts are got to feel like we have in some way failed because we're not getting that moment or the series of moments where we have exposed Bernie Sanders uh, for either having policies that don't make sense or having policies that are not popular with this broad section of people. And. And so I think there's a lot of frustration involved in this. And you can see Martha McCallum and uh, just play this exchange. About Vermont, because Vermont tried to have a single payer program. And in 2014, the Democratic governor abandoned it because he had to raise income taxes, had to raise uh, payroll taxes. And the people of Vermont didn't want their taxes no, to go it's up. Not quite true. And, that's, and, it, and they abandoned no, the program. You, so if well, you're, you're getting in Vermont, into internal Vermont politics, of which I know a little bit. Well, I'm sure you so do. I don't want to be here. Uh, so it, all right, the governor did a rather poor job. But I think if you look at polling, especially among Democrats, as I'm sure you have, you tell me strong majority of Democrats and more than a few Republicans want to see a Medicare for all program. What the opponents, and let's be clear about this, Martha. When you are dealing with an health care, which is, what's it, 18% of our GDP? I mean, we're talking about three and a half trillion dollars a year. And you have insurance companies that make billions and billions of dollars in profit. Let me give you an example, if I might, of the dysfunctionality of the current health care system. Recently, um, Aetna merged with CVS, you may recall that, big merger, which in my view will drive health care costs up. The gentleman who was head of uh, Aetna, a name Mr. Bertolini, you know what he got for putting together that merger? He got a $500 million bonus. Do you think that's how we should spend health care no, dollars? I mean, I think everybody is in agreement that health care needs to be fixed in this country. The question is how. And my question to you was it, it will drive up taxes to pay for health care. And not just the wealthy will pay for that. The middle class right. will also okay. pay for Very it. Very good. So how do you justify it? And All right, Martha, what are you not including in your discussion? Can you tell me? I will tell you. You're not going to pay any health insurance premiums. <laughs> But look, Martha, say one way the other. Martha, whether it's in your income oh, tax or your payroll tax, you're right. Pay. Look, health care is not free. You never heard me not. suggest that we're going to match. You just said it was going to be free for everyone. It's going to be free at the point of when you use it. OK, in you go to. Why are you so shocked by this? Because someone's going to pay. Goes, somebody is going <laughs> to pay. Who are they? Who OK, pays? OK, one minute, one second. Okay, Relax. I'm just we'll be talking. Please. We'll get through this it's together. It's a common question. <laughs> we had, okay. the, All we right, had here so we many email questions. OK. Sanders, how he is fair going enough. To pay. I got it. It's a fair. But question. the first thing, let's just say <laughs> hypothetically, okay. you're uh, you are um, self-employed, and you have you got a husband and two kids. Okay, family of four. Do you know how much that family is paying today for health care? How many? Twenty-eight thousand dollars a year. Okay. All right, we're spending eleven thousand dollars per person. We are saying to that family of four, you ain't going to pay that twenty-eight thousand. You're not paying any more premiums. You're not paying any more co-payments. You're not paying any more deductibles. How's that? $28,000 you are not paying. But does that mean you're not going to pay something? Of course it does. You're going to pay more in taxes. And do members of Congress who now have gold-plated health insurance... Pause it for one second. Now, now, this is really sort of fascinating, right? Because, like, that is... That you can almost see Martha, like, looking, like, a little bit flush there, right? Like, she's like... She doesn't have anything else to say. He's just conceded what she thinks is the sort of like the 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 you know the the stake through the heart of this program where he says, "Yeah, no, of course. 
you're going to pay more in taxes. You're going to pay less for premiums. That is the easy calculation here. And there has been, and the thing is, is that there is no, there has been no one who has been able to produce a report. There's been no research. There's been no estimates. Even the, the Mercatus study from uh, the right-wing think tank, there has been nothing released by anyone who can, re who can refute that central dynamic. And the thing that Bernie is doing that is different from when they talked about where in Vermont it failed was a Governor Shulman, I think it was his name. The, the thing that Bernie is doing, and, and we used to get calls from John from San Antonio would call in all the time about this very point, is that you must lead with the idea that taxes are going to be raised because taxes are going to be raised. And Bernie makes the point. It is free at the point of service and it is free when you pay for it, but, you're, but it's not free. You're going to have to pay for it. It's going to be in taxes. And middle-class people as well as wealthy people are going to pay more in taxes. But the net expenditures are going to be less because you're not going to be paying for premiums and for basically the profits and the inefficiencies in the private insurance market. And then, you know, it doesn't even bring up the fact that like, and then the other good news is you're not going to have to deal with a tremendous hassle. Like I, like I have like spreadsheets. I have uh, Google drives with that. I take pictures of like, you know, Saul's eye therapy and I take the pictures and I upload them and then I see if the, you know, my insurance is going to pay for them and I got decent insurance. All right, good. But does that mean you're not going to pay something? Of course it does. You're going to pay more in taxes. And do members of Congress who now have gold-plated health insurance. No, we don't. Well, they have a special plan that's outside Obamacare. Uh, mm. A different plan. You know, do member of, members of Pause Congress. Pause it for one second. You know who has a plan that's outside of Obamacare? Right there. Most people. Yeah, almost everybody. Yeah. <laughs> the only people, it's 10 million people in this country who have a plan inside of Obamacare. And you have something like 270, 280 million people covered by uh, insurance in this by country. By the way, unless you want to define Obamacare as Patient Protection Act, in which case everybody's covered by it and everybody loves it. Well, like, oh, well you can't Congress discriminate against me has a different having... health care right. thing, just like Brett Baer has. No, 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 no I understand one, that. But... I'm just saying if he's using it, and it, it, of course, we know that in terms of actual plans, but the patient protection component of it is national and protects a lot of people. Yeah, yeah like he's talking about the exchanges conditions. here. I think. Yeah, he's right. I think that's but what he's trying to talk Obamacare about. But right. Obamacare has more than that, just the exchanges. Right, well, it's Medicaid too, but I th the, the real question is like, why is Brett Baer bringing this up now? Because like Bernie has now destroyed McCain Allen's one critique. And so he's pivoting to, we can't really trust Congress people because you guys get, you're, you're, you're out of this whole system. You're going to try and be out of this whole system. That's where he's going with this. Go back a little bit and you'll see, this is, this is the, they have now gone from the Alamo to like the next redoubt, right? Like where it's like, okay, we're going to go to the farthest reaches of the Alamo because we're, we, we, need, uh, we need to figure out some way of undercutting this. And it's the classic, well, we can't trust government. And because politicians all lie. It does. You're going to pay more in taxes. And do members of Congress who now have gold-plated health insurance. No, we don't. Well, they have a special plan that's outside Obamacare. Uh, Mm. A different plan. You know, do member of, members of Congress, are they going to do that transition as Damn well? Damn right. Of course. Of course. Why Whoops. Uh, but I, I want to make the point. Bummer. I want to get back to Pause the point. Pause it. No, this, is, this is where Brett Baer, if he's really on his game, or McCallum, if she was really on her game, she's going to go, well, because this is the last, the last refuge is, how many pages is it? Because that, that was the way that it went with, uh, with Obamacare. Right. There was a problem with the program. And then it was like, well, <laughs> but congressmen aren't going to put themselves in it. And then it was and it was over 100 pages. Like, literally, this was a talking point at the time. I in that Glenn Beck uh, rally I went to. One of the common complaints about Obamacare was nobody knows what's in it. And they passed it. It's over 100 pages. There shouldn't be anything. Everybody's just saying four pages. That should be the top. This of, will uh, probably be a shorter yeah. bill. Yeah, exactly. a shorter yeah bill. come at me, bro. Of course, of course. Why would you suggest otherwise? But I, I want to make the point. 
I want to get back to the point that Martha raised. Look, healthcare costs money. Every other country, or virtually every country, does it in the same way we do education for our kids. Okay, when a kid walks into school, kid doesn't have to take out a credit card, right? It's paid for out of public funds. That's what most countries do. So if you're asking me, if your question is a fair question, are people going to pay more in taxes? Yes. But at the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of people are going to end up paying less for health care because they're not paying premiums, co-payments, and deductibles. We're going to get it. Yeah, there we go. We're going to take a break. Look Look at that. Look at the face. Look at that. Look at that. I think I handled that. Pretty well. Yep, there you go. Uh, smooth Bernard. Call that me. Again. You know, that's the great. Inc- what I love about Bernie is like some people contrasted spin with complexity, right? Like, oh, well, if you're speaking in spin and sound bites, then you're not acknowledging how complicated these issues are. He's great because it's like it actually is super simple and he has great message discipline, but it's also clear and honest and direct. But the, the, the key is what um, John from San Antonio would call in years ago to complain about. So I said was clear and honest. Leading with the taxes. Yes. And that was there was an attempt by, I think, Democrats for a long time. And part of it was, you know, back in the day, like Walter Mondale and whatnot uh, was. If you say you're going to raise taxes, the American public is necessarily going to have a problem with it. As if there is no argument, as if the American public cannot understand the concept that right now you're paying $10 for something. And if you we're going to eliminate that $10 expense, but it will cost you $6. And didn't also Mondale, if I didn't he like sort of basically say like we're going to just impl- taxes as austerity to pay off the deficit or something if i know if i've heard that correctly it was not presented as it was something like we need to pay for things yeah and, it wasn't yeah. like presented as part of a ambitious no, agenda to there take was care no of way, things for people there was no agenda as far as i can tell and that for was, what it's worth you think of obama they they soft pedaled obamacare costing something and i'm be much more pissed about having a having my premiums jacked up than having my taxes jacked. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, getting a kind of not that good silver plan and finding out it still costs $100 if I need to go to the doctor for a sick visit, which is the thing that happened to me. Um, Yes. And so uh, this was by leading with that taxes. It makes it also makes his job, frankly, easier because other people have to try and hide the ball. And he's not trying to hide the ball. He's trying to say, like, look at the ball. It's a good ball. It's a good um, ball, and most people will not save. So here is the end of Bernie Sanders' uh, town hall on Fox News, ladies and gentlemen. And if um, I don't think in a million years uh, that anyone would have predicted that the town hall is going to end in this fashion, like it turns into some type of like religious revival, uh, you know, show. Where, like, I, I, I mean, honestly, like, I, I, I don't know who could have done better on Fox News. Like, who are their regulars? I don't think, like, Sean Hannity gets this treatment from an audience. And y- you know that somebody has gotten in trouble because of this uh, in some fashion. And they're not clear why or how this happened. They're all just sort of shrugging their shoulders. And the next time you go to a Fox News town hall, there's going to be full vetting of every um, of every uh, audience member. And they're going to make sure that they are, you know, a a member of the Freedom Caucus uh, fan club or whatever it is. uh, I think one of the kids that asked a question, maybe the first question was a turning point kid. Yeah, that's the amazing thing about it, though, is that like this is how it ended. We're going to give him a floor for a closing statement here. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I hope I wasn't too hot on you. That's all right. <laughs> we can take it. All right. All right. Look, pause um, it. Thank- this is what we were saying earlier that was so um, that was done so well by Bernie in this. He got his proposals out there. They turned out to be extremely popular on this show. But he also undercut both the hosts and Fox as an institution. And that's a very helpful twofer, uh, frankly, for society writ large, regardless of, of how Bernie Sanders does uh, in this campaign or off of this show. Uh, being able to do both those things is a 
is, is a service to the country as far as I'm concerned. Um, thank you all uh, very much for being here and thank everybody for watching. Just a couple of points. Uh, I think sometimes the divisions in this country get a little bit too hot. Okay? At the end of the day, we are all Americans who love this country. And I also think, and the media plays not a good role in this, and again, not just Fox, is we have a lot more in common than most people think we do. All right, poll after poll. Should we raise the minimum wage to a living wage? Yes. Should Pause we it now rebuild? for one second. And just, uh, uh, go back here because that point of departure where he says we have a lot of things in common. Every other politician that you will hear who is a Democrat, when they launch into that, the things that will follow is like, no. we all love our, our kids. We all like a hot meal. Opportunity. We 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 all want to see. You know, we all love our our well, spouse. Brendan said the keywords. Right. They exactly. literally say the keywords. That's exactly right. right. That's we've such all a got good passion point. and right. humbleness. Right. We all care about our community. Just pablum. Yeah. Was, oh, we're all human beings. No. Pa really? Well, yeah. We're. I mean, like literally, it's all just that type of pablum. But he goes into <laughs> basically a litany of progressive policy points and doesn't even start with one that he would expect everybody to be on board with there no, are people that are just, opposed to minimum wage increase. which is and it there are, there are plenty of people who don't want a 15 dollar minimum wage we've had them on this program uh but apparently uh and, and this is what is was was awesome about this moment and i don't think that bernie expected it to go in the place that it ended up going should we raise the minimum wage to a living wage yes should we rebuild our crumbling infrastructure? Yes. Should we make sure that our veterans get the health care that they have earned? Yes. All right. Should we make sure that we do not cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid? Yes. Should we give huge tax breaks to billionaires? Yes. You know, that's how most people feel. <laughs> so I hope I hope, look, I'm looking forward to a good campaign. And the last point that I want to make, and I thank Fox uh, you know, for the opportunity of being here, and, and that is I want to see our country have the highest voter turnout in the industrialized world, not one of the lowest. So no matter what your views are, get involved in the political process, stand up and fight to make this a better country. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Wow. I mean, he could have gone even further. He could have been like, uh, we're all for a free public college, right? We're all for <laughs> nationalizing the oil industry. So as you can see, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're we all basically have, socialists here. We should expropriate the banks, right? Hell yeah. They're Jamie gonna... Dimon should be hung in a public square. <laughs> and like, they're going to say that this audience was stacked or whatever, but like, a lot of the people watching are probably on Social Security and care about these things, too. Of course. But, I mean, how can they say that this audience was stacked? It was a Fox event. Yeah. I mean, they organized it. They didn't. There's no control or input from the campaign. I mean, if there's was, no yeah. there's nobody sitting around Fox going like, oh, we should not have uh, done all of our flyering for this thing at the DSA convention. Right. They're not. They're not saying that. And um, it, it but it. No, most normal people like this stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I also just think like, you know, I, I was obviously very bullish and, you know, this, I just, you know, didn't buy the argument that Bernie shouldn't do Fox. And I think frankly, and I want to be really clear, I would not criticize any candidate for doing it. You know, anybody gets offered a town hall on a major network who's running for president should do that is my opinion. But I also think that. Uh, you know, it, it, there sh there should be more bullishness and confidence in our views and perspectives, because exactly what Sam said, not only did he put across great policies, he also steadily undermined this toxic propaganda cancer on our country, which is Fox News. This is uh, this is the one that was going around. It's from March uh, 17th through 20th. But uh, a Fox News poll, how would you vote if the candidates in 2020 were Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, 40 to 47? Uh, other 4% wouldn't vote, 3% unsure, 5%. I mean, it's better than uh, Bernie being down. But, you know, at, the, at this point, uh, you know, Bernie's winning, winning by a little bit. You want to see over 50% before you start, like, getting bragging rights for something like this. 
Uh, but it's that's pretty good. But and, and what's gonna... the methodology of a Fox News poll? They had a. Th- they said the. Um, they have a margin of error there of three percent. I guess the uh, sample size is a thousand and two. You know. need to go in to look at the cross tabs. How many Democrats? How many Republicans have they uh, have they have looked at? But uh, and popular vote may not be um, the 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 issue, right? I mean, it wasn't last time. Let's go to the yeah, phone. Improve those numbers. Call from a two one zero area code. Who's this? Where are you call from? Good afternoon, Sam. This is John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. Were your ears ringing uh, early? Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I just I wasn't uh, talking. I'm going to actually address some of that later in the in the call. So, so okay. first, you know, Bernie was incredible last night, and his Fox Town Hall reminded me of what a great communicator he is, and how deeply underrated he is as, as a political force uh, that is driving a movement that's just beginning. Uh, you know, yesterday's uh, national uh, Emerson uh, national poll had Bernie up by five points over Biden. Uh, that was the first national poll where he's leading Biden since mid-December. Uh, and the latest morning consult poll con- uh, configuring Biden's second choice tallies. If Biden doesn't run, Bernie's up by 23 points over Harris, which is an improvement from his national polls from early March when Bernie was leading by 19 and 17 points without Bi- Biden in the race. And I've talked about how performing well on Super Tuesday is crucial for a Bernie victory in state polls with Biden out of, out of the race. Bernie's up by 10 points in Alabama and by one point in California and eight points in uh, South Carolina with Biden out of the race. So uh, Bernie is always great at explaining why a Medicare for all is the best uh, way forward. Uh, common criticism for Medicare for all, how is it going to be funded? And you played the clip with Martha McCallum. Uh, which I was going to refer to, but uh, you did a very good job with that. And okay. so, so let me let me touch on this. The reason the funding didn't work in Vermont for their plan is because they didn't put a tax on employers like Bernie's white paper uh, does. He puts a 7.5 percent uh, tax on employers. Now, if you look at the Poland plan, which I uh, spoke about uh, by the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, professor uh, that he uh, talked about uh, at the Sanders Institute in uh, December, he has an 8.2 percent employer tax or uh, 1.7 percent gross receipt tax. Now, the rate of around 7.5 percent is also paid by employers in the Swiss system, the German system, and in the Dutch system. So uh, we're already paying 1.45 for Medicare funding. Uh, Employers are already paying this. So the increase will be about 6.05%. So employers with their first $2 million in payroll would be exempt from this premium. And in the, the Poland plan, small businesses are also exempt. Uh, though a definition of what a small business plan is not listed. Uh, So even one of the best healthcare reporters, uh, uh, Sarah Cliff, he recently interviewed, keeps going back to, you know, if you can't fund a Vermont single payer, how can you fund a national plan? In her articles on the Jayapal plan, which didn't have a funding mechanism listed, or Bernie's new plan. Uh, Do you think Bernie uh, should have gone into the details, or is that too wonky for the average voter. It's too wonky. I mean, I think, I think like, look, once you admit to the American public that we're going to need new taxes and you can explain to them, here's the, here's the basic dynamic, because this is also true on some level for businesses too, right? Because they've got to provide health insurance. You know, when we talk about employers, the size they're providing health insurance uh, for their employees. Um, And so there's a cost associated uh, for them that's being taken away that uh, is replaced with a tax. And of course, there's probably, you know, uh, productivity benefits to them in terms of having their workers healthy. Uh, You know, Jamie's not going in to see the doctor because it's going to cost her a hundred bucks. And then she gets a sinus infection. She's out for two days. Um, I mean, that's the the dynamic that, you know, if I've I've got got a $2 million payroll, that has real implications uh, for me. I mean, and when you talk about things like, uh, you know, they used to say, and we, we don't hear it much anymore, but, uh, you know, every General Motors car, like, you know, 1500 bucks worth of it is health care. 
that that rolls off. And so, um, if we have a more efficient system that um, we would get with a single payer, because we would start to have more rational pricing involved, and we would really give us an opportunity to move to a more of like a, um, you know, sort of a uh, uh, a uh, you know a system where you actually you know don't just address problems, but you address ongoing health, right? Where you actually manage your health as opposed to try and uh, manage your problems uh, so that you can avoid getting sicker. I mean, these are, these are all the benefits that are going to come with a better system. That's why, why other countries have better health outcomes. So I think you don't need to go into those specifics because I don't believe there is more than a handful of people who are out there, who are actually like, um, you know, talking about the, uh, you know, a percentage or two or the funding mechanism in terms of employers. The basic, the basic premise is you're going to pay more in taxes and net less in premiums and other associated costs. And once you sell that to the American public, once you tell them, I mean, you know, who wouldn't take that? I think I think there is value in the uh, the policy stuff, but not at the level of pitching it to the American public. I think that's what happens once you know uh, a, Ber a Bernie gets elected or anybody gets elected who wants to pr uh, push a program like this. Then you start to have those debates as part of the legislative process. But in terms of electoral process, I think that's just too much. I think it just gets too in the weeds. Right, but I mean, th th there should be some pushback against people who are saying that, just like, you know, journalists out there. I mean, because this is the constant refrain. This is the, the number one uh, issue on uh, why, why people don't want it, you know. I mean, th there's, there's no question about it, you know, that, that the funding is what the, uh, people are concerned about. Well, I think, yeah, I think so, my I mean, point is, is it's enough to say taxes are going to go up. But you're going to save money. Um, but but the, but you but individuals are going to save money on their health care uh, at the end of the at the end of the day uh, when you tally up what you've paid in taxes and what you've paid in premiums and copays and whatnot. You're going to save money. Okay, uh, you know as as far as uh, Pelosi uh, holding her caucus together. You know, I've been very disappointed. You know, if you look at uh, – there was a vote on the 28th of February uh, where they had to recommit a, a bill about, uh, about uh, you know, gun – having more gun background checks that, that the Republicans put a uh, – you know, recommitted it to where they, they threw in this ICE. Uh, you know, anybody who wanted right. to buy a gun had to be reported to ICE. And, you know, also they, they didn't hold their caucus together on the $15 minimum wages, which was one of the first thing that, they pro that Pelosi promised. She doesn't have the votes to do this. She only has 205 votes when she needs 217. And, and also there's a balanced budget amendment that, that's being talked about by, you know, Republicans have wanted to push forever uh, that, uh, that the, the Blue Dog Conference is, is behind. And so I think that one of the issues that, that isn't being talked about enough is that Pelosi can't control the conservatives in, our, in their caucus, you know. And so, uh, I, I mean, and how, is, how is she – if the, they do – you know, Democrats do win the White House and do win the Senate, and the conservatives are so afraid of going about – you know, having Republican uh, challengers, you know, two years in the future or a year and a half in the future that they can't pass anything, then what, you know, I mean, there is value in stopping the Republican agenda, but you've got to pass your own prerogatives, and, and she's not doing that. Well, she's not holding her caucus together I, I mean, on these issues. It is, uh, it could be, I mean, part of the problem is, is that you've just picked up 40 um, you know, 40 seats and a significant amount of those seats are coming from purple districts. And the, if those seats have been flipped, the, the thing that those new Congress people have on their mind is that the thing could flip back. And the only thing I can tell you is that 
A, there must be, we need to, uh, to the extent that there are blue districts and safe seats, you need to primary those people and push them to the left, right? So you can't, so you're picking up five or 10 seats that way. Even if, even if you don't win in the primary, if you create the, the, the fear coming not from the general, but from the primary, that's the way they're going to function, right? Um, and, and then I think you also got to hope that four years out, these people are, are more confident about maintaining their seats in these purple districts. That's the only thing I can tell you. Because I don't but think... Why are they so... Af- why are they so afraid, you know, to vote for a $15 minimum wage, you know, when that was promoted, you know, uh, and, you know, they're getting backing from third way to, to not to do this, to have these. But the reason why you're wages. the reason why most of these people who are taking backing from third way, the reason why they do that is because they're coming from a district that they just barely squeaked by. And that has traditionally been a Republican district. And so they're worried that they're going to lose their seats. And so the question is, is that how do you in those purple districts, how do you create more of a a rising tide from progressives to give these people more confidence that um, if they err, they should err on the uh, on the left side of the ledger as opposed to the right side of the ledger. And then separate category of people. When you have uh, districts that are comfortably blue, you've got to primary those those candidates. And even if you lose the primary challenge, it creates a different set of incentives for them. They've got to hold for the next primary as opposed to the general election. I mean, that's what happens like with, with, with Lindsey Graham, right? That's why he's such a freak show now. Because in part, because he's well, afraid I'm- of getting primaried. Yeah, I, I see your point, and I, I agree with your with what you're saying. But I mean, it, at some point, you know, leadership has to tell them, you know, you were elected as a Democrat. But John, you have to, John, John, you have to I agree vote with your caucus. I, I agree with you, John. But 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 the the certain reality is is that Nancy Pelosi, and I am not happy with the way that she's been talking lately. And maybe part of the reason why she's been talking this way is because of the dynamic you're talking about, right? Like. She is um, she has a sense of what where the caucus is at, and she has definitely shown in the past an ability to deliver votes. Right. I mean, she, she we never saw well, when she Mar- had 257 House members. She did. She, now that she has 235 or in somewhere in that area, she can't deliver. them. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I mean, I I don't know. You, it could be just that she's not good at her job. Or it could be that there's just not enough progressives in the House to 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 push this agenda, and and so the question is, how do you push these other uh, Congress people to the left? That becomes the yeah, question. Like true. you know, and and here's the thing, like you know, how many votes? Like I would imagine, this is just a total guess on my part, but just generically speaking, there's got to be a list, right, of votes that are. We need everybody voting on these. And then there's a second tier of votes. We don't need it. We, we can release people on this. And you have to release people on some to get them on the other ones that are that much more important. And remember, you know, at the end of the day, nothing's going to get passed with this Senate and with this president. So you're going to want to keep people in line to stop legislation Right. To stop something like a bun, uh, a, a budget balance, uh, a balanced budget amendment. You're going to want to keep people in line for that. So but I, I, I agree with you. It's 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 frustrating. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to be talking to uh, David Dayan tomorrow about um, Pelosi's um, top advisor, who is um, this guy, Wendell Primus, who is a um, was not a great guy. And I'm going to try and get a sense from Dayan as to uh, what that dynamic is. But I appreciate the call, John. All right. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Speaking of horrible people, um, 
right after the uh, Bernie Sanders Fox Town Hall, they, um, uh, Martha McCallum went home and cried. No, she didn't. She tried to stop her crying by bringing on Arthur Laffer, who Arthur Laffer was the genius behind the whole idea of trickle-down economics, where it's like um, if we concentrate all of the tax benefits and the wealth at the top, it will shower down upon us, right? Like the, like the clouds, you know, the clouds get so thick with moisture that they, they rain. So in this it rain. Yeah, it would be like a shower, like, a, like it, and all the shower of gold. You'd get this golden shower on everyone mm. from, uh, from all the money being concentrated at the top. And Arthur Laffer had this theory, and he had this thing called the Laffer Curve, which he wrote on the side of a napkin, was, so you know it's true. And it suggested that there, is a, um, that there is a tax rate in which everybody would decide, like, oh, it's not worth it for me to earn another dollar. So I'm going to stop working. Now, of course, that in some way ignores the concept of, of, of marginal tax rates because we don't all have the ability to say like, oh, I'm going to make sure that my income comes in at $2.9 million as opposed to like $3.1 million because every dollar after $3 million will be taxed at a 70% rate, let's say. And so I'm going to just land at 2.9 because... My return, my, you know, every dollar, I'm only getting uh, 30 cents on the dollar over 3 million. Well, most people don't have the ability to sort of land their income in that fashion. If you're in the neighborhood of getting $3 million, it's quite possible you might get $3.3 million by mistake. But this theory that Laffer had promoted the idea that we should cut taxes on the wealthiest people because that's going to create economic growth. And so who better to go to than to Arthur Laffer uh, to talk about uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, plans to tax people for health care and, in fact, to talk about Bernie Sanders' tax returns. You know, it's an interesting thing that you bring up with regard to charity. And, of course, every American can give or not give. It's their, you know, it's their Posit. right to do. Now, so they're looking at uh, Bernie Sanders' taxes, and uh, apparently in some years he gave virtually nothing to charity. Some years, just a couple of percentage points, but no no tithing like you would uh, is, is called for uh, by the Lord. Whatever they want uh, in charity, so I don't begrudge him. He, I think it was 3%, 3.6% maybe, Art. But the whole basis of what he's talking about is that we all should want to give back more to even out the income inequality in this country. Well, he doesn't say we should want to. He says we will be forced to if he gets in. That's what he's going to do to the tax codes. And, you know, what he doesn't talk about, Martha, which is really serious here, if I may, what he doesn't talk about is how those taxes, when he's putting them on, will affect the economy. You know, whenever you do redistribution, and his whole thing was energy, was environment, was health care, was education, all of that, whenever you redistribute income, you take from those who make a little bit more and you give to those who make a little bit less. By taking from those who make a little bit more, you reduce their incentives and they work a little bit less and produce a little bit less. By giving to those who have a little bit less, you provide them with an alternative source of income other than working, and they too will produce a little bit less. Now this is math. It's not, it's not right wing, left wing, Republican, Democrat. Pause, 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 pause. Now do you understand here what, what, what okay, Put aside the fact that they don't seem to understand the difference between charity and taxation and that they're like, but what the kind of giving he wants to give would be mandated by the government. Yeah, that's called taxation. Arthur Laffer would have you believe, you ready for this, that if you're rich and you get taxed more, you're going to work less. In other words, if you get to have less money when you work, you're going to work less. But if you get to have more money, if you're, as you say, you have a little bit less, if you get more money, you're also going to work less. Isn't that convenient <laughs> that both, if you're rich and you don't make, you don't make as much money because you get taxed more, you're going to work less. 
And if you're not rich and you get a little more money, you're going to work less. This is like the in Iraq invasion intelligence of economics. And now there's that's one way. You could just use reason to say that that's not true. And he just says it's just math. It's just math. Aside from the fact that there is absolutely no evidence, zero evidence, even anecdotally, of someone who said, you know what? My marginal, my marginal tax rate was, let's say, 50%. 50% of every dollar over the first $10 million I make. And so, you know what? I hung back a little bit. I just decided to land it. I'm going to work so that I make $9.5 million every year. Because they, when you get over $10 million, if I'm only making 50 cents on the dollar, forget it. Why am I putting in that extra 11 minutes a week or whatever it was that uh, supposedly this person's going to work less? Or paying people to work for you, which is how a lot of the wealthy make their money. Of, of course. Of course. So not only is there no evidence for that assertion, and there's no evidence for the assertion that if we provide free childcare, free daycare, pre-K, uh, higher education, if we provide health care with the raising of taxes that people are going to work less. No evidence for that whatsoever either. There's a lot of evidence that Arthur Laffer doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. So we all remember Kansas, right? Kansas is a state in this country. I'm familiar. And in 2012... Governor Sam Brownback was elected and maybe it was elected in, was it in 2010? I can't remember. But by 2012, they had passed a massive tax cut bill that was drawn up by Arthur Laffer. And the whole idea was very similar to the one that uh, Donald Trump passed. If you're an S-Corp, you get uh, huge tax breaks and uh, we're going to eliminate the income tax for, you know, for S corps and all sorts of tax cuts. And what was going to happen according to Arthur Laffer, right? Is that it was going to spur economic growth. And it was actually, the idea is this, is that when you cut taxes, you're actually going to increase revenue because it's going to spur so much economic growth that more people are going to get involved and more people are going to pay taxes. So the, the amount of taxes is going to be less, but the amount of people that are going to be paying that smaller amount is going to be so great that it's actually going to increase uh, how much revenue you're taking in. Here is a graphic of Sam Brownback's vanishing surplus. It goes from 2013 at its peak, $700 million down by... 2015 to 30 million dollars and let's see the next slide they had to cut everything the s p downgraded uh their um they downgraded their credit rating because of sam brownback's tax cuts which caused massive cuts to education massive cuts to education it slowed job growth relative to all the states around kansas it slowed economic growth relative to all the states around Kansas, including the country. But, but more importantly, around Kansas. So it wasn't just a regional thing. Look at this. Sam Brownback's tax cuts, now full-blown disaster for Kansans. Kansas tax cut experiment crashes and burns. By 2016, the Republican legislature in Kansas had raised taxes. So Arthur Laffer is sitting there telling us all about what is uh, math. Play this a little bit more. Listen to this. Uh, this. What do you we'll call produce it? a little bit less. Now this is math. It's not. It's not right wing, left wing, Republican, Democrat. It's not liberal or conservative. It's just plain economics. Whenever you redistribute income, you reduce total income, and that is what he's doing. And I am very afraid that if he were elected. We would have an enormous crash in the market. Now, that crash would come in anticipation of his election, but it's much like Obama, who I believe was the reason why we had the Great Recession. As he got closer and closer to winning, the markets collapsed. 
Wow. <laughs> this is like psychic economics. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> if that's basic economics, I'm starting to think economics might be bullshit. Let me tell you something. He's not I, a pederast. It's a, he's a, he's a, uh, yeah. pedantic. He's a little bit yeah, pedantic. pedantic. Yes, yeah, I pederast. was wondering yeah, right. what word you were not looking right. for right. there. Definitely um, pedantic. Pedantic. Not the right. other no, one. Strike exactly. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, strike that. Strike Correction. That. I apologize. Absolutely um, struck from the... There was a reason why I gave you a very weird, meaningful right. look. Well, I think... But... Um, the idea that there was a stock market crash, something wrong. stock market crash because people anticipated Barack Obama's election. This is something that honestly, if you were to say this in public, like if, if it wasn't Martha McCallum there and he was on another network, there would be people with white coats to say like, me, Arthur, maybe it's time for you to take a little break. I think you're a little tired. But this is, this is how they're going to try and explain away any type of recession that hits with Donald Trump. I think that the economic they're recovery... They're aware that Bernie Sanders might win the election, well, so they're look, all... I took a couple of economics classes, and I think that the economy recovered because of the stimulus and also in anticipation that Bernie would be elected in 2020. There was people I think had there that were early signals that there would be a serious plan for the working and middle classes that would emerge in 2020, which is why the economy actually started to recover in 2009 and 2010. Maybe. Well, that's what I think. That's my well, very strong sense. It's not like trickle-down economics has been tried already or given a fair hearing, so maybe we should give it a chance. Right. Well, we should maybe... Well, I mean, I think to a certain extent uh, we have with the Republican tax cut, and it has done nothing. I mean, it is J.P. Morgan uh, $3.6 billion worth of uh, extra cash this year, which I guess that should help the um, real estate market on uh, in the Hamptons. But that's about it. Uh, meanwhile, we mentioned earlier that uh, it was funny to watch Bernie say, like, you know, we're all Americans. We all agree that we should have $15 minimum wage and we should not uh, allow tax cuts for, um, you know, wealthy people. Well, here is another person running in the Democratic primary who's doing it all wrong. This will probably be the first and the last <laughs> clip that we play of Eric Saw a Swalwell on this show. Uh, I know. Uh, but it, it is... Um, he might produce a few more it's possible. pretty good pieces of sound. His, his slogan, go big, be bold, do good. What could be... And to be fair... This is a joke. It's pretty bold at this point to say... What we the real problem we have will be cured by bringing Republicans into my Democratic administration. I'm the son of two Republicans. I married a Hoosier from southern Indiana who grew up in Penn's country. I've worked with Republicans my whole life, reaching across the dinner table and reaching across the aisle. Pause it. Even the audience that has been handpicked to come and see him speak, they're laughing at this stuff because they can't possibly believe that he's going to go where he's going. Right? They all think that, like, he's about to say, and I'll tell you, I'm surprised at how much of lunatics they are, and we should keep them very far away from government. Nope. Across the aisle. I go on Fox News just so most of my family can see me on TV. <laughs> We must unite our deeply divided country. So I pledge to lead our country with a team of rivals, a blended cabinet of Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> Not because it'll be easy. And we may have to send out a search party to find more Republicans who can put country over party. Yeah. Are we sure this is not a Sasha Baron Cohen character? No kidding, right? Played by Matt Damon. Yeah, exactly. Um, that does not sound like somebody who wants to win the Democratic primary. But literally, what is he trying? I mean, is he? He is in Congress, so presumably he's got more going on than being a Klippenstein brother or a. What are they called again? Not Klippenstein. I always forget. Krasenstein. That. And by the way, I like the Krasensteins. I'm a defender of the Krasensteins. But like, what is the play here? Like, 
You already have a seat in Congress, so that confers a little bit of legitimacy. I think like this is just an embarrassment. I think he's running. I think he's running for vice president, and I'm not sure for who. Uh, well, for for somebody, I don't know who's. You no, know I've been laying down markers be. of when I go dum dum. I'm going to add if he is vice presidential pick, I will not be voting for the Democratic I, ticket. I find it very hard to believe. Well, it raises your profile, right? I think that's why a lot of these no name Democrats are doing it. Yeah, I think yeah, that's basically Eric Swalwell. It. I don't know. Eric Swalwell says some very good things. <laughs> Russia's a bunch of motherfuckers. Right. We all need to sit down, cross the table, give each other health care, and protect, us, protect each other from fluoride in the water. Resist Putin. Resist Putin. Someone used him as an Vladimir example Putin of what, what of the dangers college. of, because I think in that same speech he said, like, you know, Donald Trump is controlled by Russia or whatever it is. Or, or he straight Donald up Trump said is, that? I don't know if he said that That's or if what? it was something like. He's still uh, banging that he's, Trump? Like he's, that. Yeah, Donald Trump is, uh, you know, Putin's, you know, greatest uh, dream or He's something. Putin's bitch. They're, they're gay together. together. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember what Putin the. Putin and Trump are totally gay. I can't Look remember. This mural. I couldn't. I couldn't remember what. I can't remember what the quote was. But they're like, this is the problem with RussiaGate, and I couldn't help but think like. Yeah, exactly. That it's a guy no, polling like, 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 yeah, like less a guy than like zero point one percent. Right, exactly. Saying nonsense. Like a guy who's just you know shows up on on uh, MSNBC a lot. Um, and another thing you're yeah, not going to like. Another thing is. you're not going to like to hear, Martha, is that Donald Trump was sucking Vladimir Putin in Helsinki. Here it, here it is. He's on uh, Morning Joe. You were way out there on the question of his campaign's relationship with Russia. And you said even in January on MSNBC when you were asked by yeah. Chris Matthews if the president is an agent of Russia, you said yes. Yeah. Do you regret saying that? No. Or do you believe that President Trump still is an agent of Russia? What do you mean by that? He acts on their behalf. He puts their mm -hmm. interests too often ahead of our own interests. And that, again, that affects opportunity at home. If, if we become more like Russia, where it's a top floor economy and only... Orders. Taking orders from Vladimir Putin. When you say agent, what do you mean by that? Well, I, if he wasn't taking orders, he wouldn't take the interpreter's notes. If he wasn't taking orders, he would release the report that he said he's 100% exonerated uh, with. And, and so why does he act so suspiciously with Russia in ways that he doesn't act with Theresa May or Macron or Trudeau? It, it just, all of my experience as a prosecutor tells me something is wrong with the way that he's acting the way that he's lying, and that we should all be concerned about. So were you surprised then that at least in the summary from the Attorney General that Bob Mueller could not find evidence of a conspiracy? No, because as a prosecutor, I know that proving a case beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest standard. All right, we don't need to hear any more of that. I mean, the, the he didn't say that in the, uh, that there was no evidence. He said maybe there wasn't enough to convict. But, uh, it, like, you know, both things can be right. One is he's acting in a very strange way that doesn't make sense. Why do you take the translator's notes? Because you're talking about something so sensitive with Putin. Like, I don't want people to realize that we're doing reproachment. I find that a little bit hard to believe, frankly. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he's an agent for Russia. But here's the other thing. It makes no difference what Eric Swalwell says on MSNBC, in my estimation. And I, I still contend. Like, it's just... Swalwell could walk into this office without his uh, congressional uh, pin on, and I think we would all just be like... Who's that dude? If he starts Matt Damon? If, yeah, exactly. If he starts pulling at 20% on this stuff, then maybe we can worry about right, it. Right, exactly. Uh, or even 10. Like the idea that there could only be that reason for Trump acting weird and making no sense is funny to me. Well, I mean, it is weird. It is definitely weird, but it could very well be he's not an agent. He's just like, what are the chances we could still do that hotel? Yeah. Also, he like thinks he's a cool guy. He's like a big macho muscle man on a horse. Like it's not that hard to figure it out. Cool, so cool. He's the coolest. Did you see that mural of Trump and Putin kissing? So yeah. cool. Yeah, here is an example of just how cool uh, Donald Trump is. He's so he. Remember, this is a guy. He loves trucks. I love big equipment. I love it. People don't know this about me, but I've got a lot of big muscles under my. I'm big muscle guy. Here he is. And we sell bubble construction equipment. Oh, we should just say that he is at the um, the NAS Truck and Equipment um, uh, with a uh, press conference 
with uh, talking in Minnesota to uh, transportation business leaders who were explaining to him what kind of trucks they have. Uh, Bob Nass, Nuss, is explaining what kind of trucks he has. Trucks, and we sell yeah. bubble construction equipment. Right. And what a better setting to have a Volvo loader yeah, and a Mack yeah. truck. And these two represent everything that builds America and moves America. That's good. That's good. That's good. Oh, how can I turn this about me? Yeah, I'm going to make this about me. I'm going to make this about me. I love that. I love it. I've been on many a loader. I've been on many a truck. People don't know that about me. It's, I guess they do, actually. Otherwise, uh, the Fifth Avenue stuff doesn't play nearly as well as that. I'll, I'll tell you. Um, you know what uh, people who have been on a lot of trucks say uh, or don't say? I've been on a many a truck. <laughs> been on a lot of loaders. I brag about how many trucks I've been on because I've been on a lot of trucks. Uh, this, the Fifth Avenue stuff doesn't play nearly as well as that, I will tell you. I've been on many, many a truck and uh, between Volvo and Caterpillar and John Deere and so many of the great companies. Can but uh, this is a real beauty and I consider it a very high-end uh, loader. It's great that you do that. I, I want to say that today is tax day. Tax day, yeah, I need to uh, get out of this it's situation. It's great that you Feeling do a little that. bit uncomfortable. That's so awesome, though. Just, yeah. Can we just take that in for a second? Tax day. It's great that you do that. It's great that. that you do the big truck thing. I love yeah. that. I love that stuff. And so if you really want to know what's going on inside uh, Donald Trump's uh, mind here, uh, in a... The, the, you really need to look uh, to uh, fiction. And uh, this is from the president show that uh, the late great president show, Anthony Adamrick, uh, and his interpretation of what must have been going through Donald Trump's mind to be around those trucks. And he did this. This is from like a year and a half ago. This is from like, the, yeah, the first few months of yeah, Trump's exactly. presidency. Gotta be what I think it is. Where's this guy? Wow! Yeah! So great, so cool. Hey, fella! What a macho guy! You wanna drive this bad boy? I wanna drive this truck! Have fun. Boom! Wow, I got it! Get in there! Yeah, I'm gonna ride this truck. <laughs> Come on, you can do it! Wow! Oh, yeah! You're a hefty fella! <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, hey, Donnie, yeah! Give us a honk! Honk! <laughs> You're free now, Donnie! Go! Bye-bye, Macho Guy. Let's go. Bye. The break. Yes. Breaker, breaker. There's a smokey on the way. There you go. That's that was him. actually. That's yeah, him. Yes. That, that's not, there's no gap between that show. But there was the, also the other clip, though. The other clip when he actually, like, it, w w in the moment, that was actually the pilot episode. Uh, so good. Oh. I missed that show. The only mistake they, they made that? in real life was, you know, not to let him keep on going forever. Well, that was the, the, the best part when he had that scene where he's like, I'm driving in the truck and I've dri I drive off the edge of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I'm in the water and, water and I finally and just let go. go. I love the Deepak Chopra one too, where he goes on that tour of his subconscious and he realizes that he is the crone and she is him. And he cries and he has this big breakthrough and then he comes out of the meditation and Deepak's like, what did you learn? And he's like, nothing. <laughs> he's like a less sympathetic version of Tony Soprano. Oh no, Tony is much more psychologically rich than Donald Trump. So um, the, still don't know the cause as of today of uh, the fire in Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. There's already apparently been, uh, you know, they're they're committed to rebuilding. But of course, you, you're going to rebuild. You've lost um, 700 years of history and some of the most beautiful glass stained, uh, the stained glass uh, windows, supposedly. And um, some of it has been, I think, was was saved, but for the most part uh, destroyed. And uh, we don't know. What, what's causing it. And just to give you a sense of how much the right wants this to be, <laughs> Muslim terrorism, terrorism performed by, you know, radical is, uh, Islamicist, whatever it is, how desperate they are 
as opposed to the idea of like, I mean, what 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 did that guy uh, was it Walsh? Who is it that, that or somebody uh, wrote uh, that guy from TP USA or Daily? Co- like, how is it? Isn't it suspicious that this thing uh, burned? Oh yeah, Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis was it? Matt Lewis, he's, he's the, the guy that we talked about yesterday, right? With yeah. the tr- he's like, I don't see how. Uh, I don't know how a fire like this could start. Right. So immediately. Yeah, it's all wood, like 700-year-old wood. Yeah, there's about 13,000 uh, oak trees right. from the 12th century. Right, it's literally like a matchbox. And um, Matt Walsh. So, oh, it's Matt Walsh, right. And um, But here is Glenn Beck basically providing you the ultimate explanation if you're a conspiracy theorist. This is the way... They're going to always say that regardless of what the authorities find was the cause of this fire, it will always be in Glenn Beck's mind this answer. The rose um, stained glass window is irreplaceable. Um, If this was arson, uh, this is going to be bad. If this was arson of any foreign uh, kind of, um, in any foreign entity, any, anybody with a grudge, um, I think if, if, and this is a huge if, it might have just been started by a cigarette, we don't know. But um, if this was start, started by Islamists, I don't think you'll find out about it. Um, because I think it would set the entire country on fire. They've had killings, they've had mass shootings, they've had people running people down in the streets. The tension is very high. You take away, this would be like us burning, what, our White House? I mean, what, what, is, what is iconic like this? World uh, Trade Centers? Yeah, <laughs> like the World yeah. Trade Center. This is their World Trade Center moment. Um, and if this was done by terrorists, uh, I... I think that uh, they will keep it quiet because I just don't think Macron and France wants that internal right. fight. Um, if this was done by somebody who is disgruntled with the government, etc., like the yellow vests, yeah. you know, they did say this weekend that the police can put bullets in their guns and they can shoot to kill the yellow vests. They said that this weekend. Uh, so maybe it's that I don't know, but this is a this is a really big deal. Uh, w- the world has lost a major, major piece of history. Today. Um, so there you have it. That is the um, that is the surefire way to make sure that uh, you will always have one answer always yeah. for anything bad that happens. Yeah, because France is so woke about Islam. The, uh, and all I hear out of there is all the ways in which they're trying really hard to be nice to Muslims in France. It's um, this is going to be the answer. We'll, if we expose the truth, then people will be rude to Muslims. <laughs> this has never been a part of any political strategy for any party in France. It's the last thing I would want to distract from my record unpopularity and ongoing protests. Is an example is an opportunity to scapegoat Muslims for a horrific terrorist attack. Please suppress it. So uh, this last clip, is that? What's this one? Oh, no. What's the other uh, Trump? Oh, we played that one. Okay. Um, l- the last thing I want to do, and then we'll go to just a couple of phone calls, and, uh, and then, then we'll get out of here, though, is this interview from uh, Melinda Gates, because I found this sort of stunning. Um, So uh, Melinda Gates was interviewed in the New York Times on uh, tech innovation, global health, and her own privilege. And um, maybe start with that one. She, uh, you know, she says to her credit, you know, nobody's had to argue with her like you're privileged in this. To her credit, um. We have to think about our privilege. I have to think about my privilege every day. She says, to her credit, good for her. That's good. Um, And they were were asked, "What's what's a recent epiphany you've had about your privilege? 
She wrote that it's not, or she answered, it's not enough to read about it. You have to be in the community with people who don't look like you. When I read about a shooting, maybe in the south side of Seattle, I'm not living the experience where if I have a friend who's a person of color, they most likely are living that experience or know somebody who is part of that community. And so my youngest daughter and I, we have a lot of friends who I'm meeting and they're of very mixed races. I love that. We have this motto we go by. Every single person who walks through our door should feel comfortable in our house, despite how large it is and that it has nice art. Wow. So here's a person who I think, you know, look, she's obviously well-intentioned. And, um, and there's no doubt in my mind that Bill and Melinda Gates, for the most part, are well-intentioned. Or let me put it this way. It's one of those things I can't possibly know, so let's assume it. Which is all the more reason why we should have laws to protect our society from people like this because they really do feel like they're well-intentioned and maybe they are well-intentioned. But the problem is that the amount of money that they have can have such detrimental effects on society when they attempt to be well-intentioned that it is unfair to the rest of us. It is undemocratic to allow two individuals who are so well-intentioned but so clueless about certain things, like anybody would be clueless about things, to have that type of impact. I could be completely clueless. But all that I'm saying into this microphone, all the cluelessness that I'm putting onto this microphone is not going to have really any type of major impact on society. But when a billionaire is clueless, they can have an enormous impact on society. So they ask her, to get back to philanthropy, what about the notion that the foundation's work on an issue like public education is inherently anti-democratic? You've spent money in that area in a way that maybe seems like it's crowding out people's actual wants in that area. What's your counter to that criticism? What this is in reference to is over the over 700 million, could be up to a billion dollars, that they dumped into the educational field invested in just a few districts in the country to test out their theories of education. Can we run this like a business? Can we assess what an educator is doing in the classroom if we, if we use metrics in the same way we would do, like how many uh, widgets are we turning out? And they did this over the course of like five or six, seven years, I think it was, an experiment. And she writes... She responds, Bill and I always go back to what is philanthropy's role? It is to be catalytic. Remember that. Remember that. It's to try and put new ideas forward and test them and see if they work. If you can convince government to scale up, that is how you have success. But philanthropic dollars are a tiny slice of the United States education budget. Even if we put in a billion dollars in the state of California, that's not going to do much. So we experiment with things. If we had been successful, David, you'd see a lot more charter schools. I'd love to see 20% charter schools in every state, but we haven't been successful. Dear God. We haven't been successful. I'd love to say we had outsized influence. We don't. Now, here's the thing. She is so clueless. She's right about the fact that what she does is to be catalytic. Because if a billionaire sinks a billion dollars into an industry, what else is going to happen? Right, her billion dollars don't measure up against what society spends on education. But all the money that's floating around out there that is looking for a future, all those schools that are desperate for dollars to get some type of program, what are they going to do? She understands they're a catalyst. But what does a catalyst do? It creates change in the marketplace, even if it's not a direct function of what they do. So if I tell you that Warren Buffett is going into, you know, he's, he's cornering the market on flip-flops, guess what everybody's going to do? Everybody's going to go and buy into the flip-flop industry. That's what happened with this. The so-called race to the top, no child left behind, value added uh, on teaching, high stakes testing, 
all a function of this experiment that the Gates Foundation ran, and they found out a year and a half ago that it was a complete and total failure. That's not my assessment. That is the Rand Corporation, which the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation hired to assess their experiment, and it failed. That's why she says, we haven't been successful. Because they failed. Now, you didn't hear about that. Maybe if you had listened to the one or two episodes we talked about on the show, you heard about it. But you didn't hear about it if you watched the news. And you barely uh, know about it if you read the newspapers. But they failed. Catastrophic failure to the point where the Rand Corporation and their internal audit basically said, it's probably right that we should just do what the educators have been saying. God but forbid. yet... Those ripples that they created are still reverberating. People are still fighting against this, what they assume to be the case, that high stakes testing is the best way to get results because of the billion dollars they dropped in there. And the problem with that is not that they're bad people or that they're clueless. The problem is they had a billion dollars that they got a tax benefit from to try out this experiment. And that's highly problematic that we incentivize and allow for just two individuals who have some kooky ideas or not so kooky ideas to change things on, on, for, you know, in the public sphere. Something that is supposed to be so democratic is public education. And this reporter pushes back. Certainly you have more influence than, say, a group of parents. Not necessarily. She says, I went and met with a group of three dozen parents in Memphis. We thought they had a good idea, a good idea for them. They were having none of it. So we didn't move forward. A group of parents, a group of teachers, they can have a very large influence. In other words, I don't understand what the word influence means. <laughs> we might not go and dump a ton of cash in a... Um, in a district where there's a lot of pushback by, by parents, but we're going to dump it somewhere. And when we dump all that cash, anybody who's involved in any type of investing or philanthropic work, it's not hard to find a school in every uh, district. Well, I, you know, I don't know how many schools people have in their districts where it's like, oh, we're, we're pursuing a tech uh, um, curriculum because that's the way we're going to get a big... Um, funding from the bill and melinda gates foundation i mean there's multiple of them so we tore around looking at middle schools and high schools in the, in just in in the, the district and my daughter goes to school in, in in brooklyn there's a couple of schools hurting for cash who are completely reconfiguring their curriculum so that they can look appealing to these type of uh foundations and not these type this foundation so it's just absurd to say a billion dollars dropped into uh, education in a concentrated way by one entity doesn't have influence. I mean, come on. If she believes this, then she's totally clueless. If she doesn't, then she's being a liar. But either way, there's only one way to deal with this. And that is to say, we're going to take that money off of your hands, or we're not going to allow you to make it. We're going to distribute that money before it ends up in your bank account. And we're going to put it into the education system where we actually have decades, if not centuries, of experience in dealing with public education. And what we lack is funding to make it, to distribute across uh, the country and across the socioeconomic um, areas to deal with it and, and create a... Um, a quality education for everyone. And then actually what we're going to do is we're going to take some of that money and we're not even going to put it in the schools. We're going to put it into the communities because educators will tell you, Bill and Melinda, that inputs are the most important determinant as to what the outputs will be at the end of the process. And they, and they came to understand that. If you go read their RAND report, that's what they ultimately learned. But meanwhile, there was a seven, 10 year period where the country just went off the rails in terms of education. And there are a lot of people who still think that these theories that have now been debunked by the very people who are pushing them are still operative. 
And the problem at the end of the day is not that they're bad people. It's just that they had too much money and it created an unbalance. Let's help them yeah, out. Yeah, and they were, you know, incentivized the by th- these kinds of narratives to believe that they're special and they're smart and they know better than everyone. Uh, I also like how she describes the meeting with the uh, parents and the teachers like, oh, it's just a friendly conversation when I'm sure that these parents and teachers are expending time and energy that they would rather use on other things just to stop these cockeyed billionaires from messing with their kids' school. Right. We could have had a uh, bake sale today and made some money instead of having to ward off the uh, the invading hordes of of, of extreme uh, high stakes testing. Frankly, I mean, even that would have been a net positive. But it, it's it, not a nice thing to make people do. This is the this is the this is the the fundamental problem with the this sort of philanthropic model. Is that? That's why I don't give. It doesn't. It. I mean, well, I don't give money. That's why I keep it. It, it it really is, and 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 you know, I mean, bless their hearts. I'm sure they're very nice people, but um, but it's too much responsibility for them. Human beings aren't supposed to have that kind of money, because it gives them an outsized power, right? That's why they have mad kings. Every couple of hundred years, you get a nice one, that's sane, but then they end up getting assassinated, probably. And that's the that's the problem with giving, um, you know, a billion dollars to uh, somebody or allow, allowing them to make it, allowing them to, uh, you know, exploit society in such a way that they accumulate that kind of money. Dead it, ass. It's 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 a real problem. There's nobody in this room who uh, who, who if I gave them a billion dollars or gave them five years and, and they got lucky enough to make a billion dollars wouldn't be completely deluded. We would all go crazy. Let's go to the phones. Speaking of, <sighs> calling from a 773 area code. Who is this? Where are you calling from? Hey, friends. You got Michael here from Berkeley, California. Michael from Berkeley, uh, California. Long-time listener. Well, yeah, you. buddy. Uh, joined back in the old Air America premium days, 2006. Wow. Um, proud to say I'm also a patron of PMBS and Antifada. Sorry, Matt. I'm, I'm going to get there, dude. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, wanted to very quickly hip you guys to uh, something that's going on out here in the Bay Area uh, about a very real opportunity that we have to replace Nancy Pelosi with a young Muslim Democratic Socialist, a Bernie Kratz, an activist, an attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, guy who's been agitating against power for over a decade, who's running on a platform of housing, health care, privacy, voting, a living wage, and climate justice as fundamental rights of all people. Sweet. Uh, his name is Shahid Buttar. Yes. I tweeted Shahid about Buttar. him the other day. That looks you. great. You did? Thank you. Yes. Uh, S-H-A-H-I-D-B-U-T-T-A-R. So he's running a really serious AOC-style primary challenge uh, in the 12th District. You know, he jumped in at the last minute, 2018, got almost 10% of the vote doing almost nothing. And he's getting in way early this time, staffing up, got a really impressive ground game. And I think he's really the best shot that we're going to have at either taking Pelosi out or at least kind of forcing her to reckon with the increasingly progressive constituency in her district and the party, uh, who, she, she, who she seems sort of eager to dismiss as she obstructs essential policies like Medicare for All, Green New Deal, and as she, of course, continues to promulgate divisive rhetoric against young and exciting progressives like AOC and Ilhan Omar. So... Just wanted to get the word out there. Um, obviously, we need Bay Area people to step up and volunteer, but you can donate from anywhere in the United States. The website is www.shahidforchange.us, S-H-A-H-I-D-F-O-R, change.us. And that's all I got for you guys. I love you so much. Left is best. Peace out. Appreciate the call. Left is best. That was By the way, one. great call. Uh, it is uh, Shahid Buttar, and it's, um, I believe his uh, Twitter handle is at S-H-E-E-Y-A-H-S-H-E-E. I think this is it, right? He's in San Francisco, won 17,500 votes for Congress in 2018. Shahid for change. Oh, yeah. That's it. Um. 
Yeah, did you see the thing that I just dropped from Pelosi? I mean, this is just getting petty. Nancy Pelosi says a glass of water could win uh, Democratic districts like AOC. Um, I mean, it's so unnecessary and so petty and so unstrategic. And also, by the way, instantly, you want to play that game. Uh, Nancy Pelosi does not have, like, the Harry Reid, I represent a state that's a swing state. She represents San Francisco. Like, if we're doing that... I'm going to say that like a bottle of kombucha could win Nancy Pelosi's district. It's um, I, I we, you know, we'll get um, a day in on tomorrow to talk about uh, Wendell Primus, who is her uh, chief advisor. And maybe he has some insight, like I said earlier, into um, into w- w- what what is the strategic what is the concept here? I mean, it, you know, the only thing I can imagine is that it has something to do with that idea that she wants to. Seem like she is on the um, on the side of uh, the conservatives in her caucus. I, I don't understand. Uh, maybe they're getting nervous. I'm not sure. I follow what it's about. But. Yeah, if, a, if a glass of water could win in that district, what's Joe Crowley's problem? Exactly. <laughs> I guess he's uh, he's a half a glass of water. Calling from uh, four seven eight area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Well, uh, with relative certitude, I declare myself Jeff from Georgia. Jeff from Georgia. What's going on, Jeff? Hey, not much, man. It's a pleasure to speak to you and the whole crew today. I hope you guys have a good one. Uh, it's, it's a little bit stale now. I've been trying to call with this topic a little bit. I want to talk about normal people. Uh, it's somewhat related to Bernie Sanders' town hall, I, I think, which was absolutely fire. Uh I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I know a few uh, normal people, whatever that means, in my life, uh, by which I mean mostly just apolitical. And uh, I'm surprised they haven't come up on the show, and there's no real nice way to say it. A lot of those people believe insane things. <laughs> uh, insane things about the world, insane things about God, insane things about humans, insane things about each other. They believe all kinds of crazy nonsense. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because there are powerful forces that we're, you know, looking to on aggregate. Make them think that way. Make them confused. And, I, you know, I think if you're going to want to reach these people and you're serious about it, you know, there's a lot of good pieces of advice I could give you or someone else could give you. But I would just say don't get ahead of yourself. Don't Don't take for granted that they just have the same level of basic knowledge that you do. You got to meet them where they're at. And if at the end of it, you get their vote, but they still think aliens built the pyramids or whatever the fuck, you don't need to be worried about that because you're not doing politics when you do that. That's 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 just what I wanted to say about that, Sam. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, And, you know, there's sometimes those things get convoluted, I think, where people want, you know, to change people culturally or on areas that are not relevant. I mean, I think what people forget is that, and this, this has come up many times uh, over the course of, of my, my doing this is where people are like, well, you're just preaching to the choir. Well, you know, the fact is, is that that's all you really need. Uh, At the end of the day, you, you know, uh, it's the electoral politics involve people who just don't pay attention. But when it comes to legislation and to actual change, three to five million motivated people in this country could could radically change the way that we do things. The, the right does nothing but this. Yep. They, he, almost their entire media project is aimed not at converting anyone or convincing anyone of anything. It's it's to rile up their base, get them excited, get their wallets open, and get them out to you know make voting literally their second job or whatever right. <laughs> you know for these like retirees of Florida or whatever. Uh, I appreciate you taking my call. Thanks, I'll Jeff. talk to you guys later. All right? right. Calling from a nine seven eight area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. Can you hear me? I can. Who's this? This is Maddie from Massachusetts. Maddie from Massachusetts. What's on your mind, Maddie? I am calling to talk um, calling to talk about the stop and shop strike that we have going on here. Sweet. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Stop and Shop is um, a large grocery store chain here in Massachusetts um, and throughout New England. 
currently 31,000 employees are uh, across 240 stores are on strike in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Wow. Um, when did it start? They are strike. Um, six days ago, they've been on strike for six days. They've been without a contract since uh, the beginning of February. Wow. Um, and so they are striking for living wages and against cuts to their benefits. Um, two things are sort of most at issue. Um, the company Stop and Shop, which is owned by a large um, holding conglomerate that has reported profits of over $2 billion. Um, Stop and Shop is, um, has agreed to raise wages for everybody. However, um, the wages aren't fully offset by the added contribution that they're asking employees to make to their health care premiums. So it will actually be a, um, a net take-home pay decrease for workers, um, which is ultimately what they're, what they're striking against. Uh, another thing that will do that is the change to Sunday pay. So currently Sunday pay um, is considered overtime pay, and so uh, workers get time and a half on Sundays. Um, they've agreed to grandfather in current workers so that they'll continue to get time and a half on Sundays, but they are also looking to undermine the union um, by saying that all new employees will not get that benefit of, of time and a half on Sundays, um, which ultimately just really destroys um, the solidarity and right. within the union. Um, and so it's really important that we fight against that and we don't allow the employer to undermine any, the union in that way. Additionally, it harms their the Sunday change in Sunday pay harms take home pay as well because the company will just put on the, the new, new workers, workers at right, the lower on wage. Sunday, of course, yeah. So, and Maddie, so, so let me ask so you this. The, mm-hmm. let, let me ask you this. What so what's happening? So our, our what, what I'm really curious about is how are shoppers reacting? How because are they crossing right, so, the picket lines and and where are you located in Massachusetts? Um, I am in Andover, Massachusetts, okay. um, near Wilmington, Tuxbury. Um, oh, dude, I know where so I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yes, customers are crossing the picket lines, and I'm, I'm concerned because I think that the general tone seems to be that people find this a, nu- find this a nuisance, don't really understand what the workers are striking for, want it to be over as quickly as possible, um, don't, don't really understand the importance of it. Um, which I just have found incredibly frustrating um, because five years ago um, there was incredible public support and public solidarity um, to support the market basket strikes. Um, so that happened in August of 2014, and it was, again, a grocery store strike. However, it was it's considered to be one of the most strange labor actions in American history because it was a, a strike in support of the owner. Right. I um, remember this. It was the the yes. owner was being bought out or something. What was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a family. It's a family owned company. Cousins. One was the CEO. One controlled the board. Right. The guy who controlled the board tried to oust the CEO, and ultimately, um, all the workers and um, the public uh, protested and boycotted the company for six weeks. I remember that. Um, until the cousin who was the CEO was able to buy out his his cousin from the company and for one and a half billion dollars. All right. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I just got an IM uh, from uh, wooden computers saying stop and shop uh, shops throughout Northeastern Connecticut are empty. People are not crossing the lines there. So that's Hell good. Yeah. <sighs> Mass holes. Yeah. Mass People holes. Right, Maddie? Not, I mean, come on. But Let's be honest. Complaints. Let's be honest. Mass holes. Mass holes. Love right? mass holes. I mean, come mass on. Holes, only mass holes would cross the picket line. I mean, to a certain extent, there is an attitude of like, come on. Just Dude, I have up. my own schedule. Yeah. Right. Ever, sure. ever since I and Dolly's uh, closed, why would I, why I need to go to Stop and Shop? Oh, I read that a famous hockey player had to apologize for crossing the picket line. Oh, that's good. Ray and, Bork. Oh, Ray Bork. Son of a yeah. bitch. Yeah. Old time. Uh, well, Elizabeth Warren apparently was on the uh, picket lines with them. That's good. Yeah. She should um, brought him Dunkin' Donuts, which is the most important thing. If you could do one thing to show your solidarity with these workers, it's bring them dunk. And look, folks, honestly, if you're in Massachusetts or you're in, uh, in, in Connecticut and you said Rhode Island as well, 
do bring them yes. stuff like that because it's not just a question of making it, uh, you know, uh, raising their morale. When other people see you bring them donuts, they start to think maybe maybe my attitude towards this needs to be maybe I need to look into this a little bit more. I mean, that's the way this stuff happens. When some people see some civilians essentially providing support for these people, it starts to make them think that, wait a second, maybe these are issues that I should be um, uh, thinking about. And so, you know, that's, I uh, appreciate the update, Maddie. Um, uh, and I guess uh, we'll, we'll try and look into it and I can get up there and take the kids. Maybe I'm going to be up in Massachusetts over the weekend. So don't go Perfect. over the line. Uh, appreciate the call. Don't be a scab, kids. Thank you so much. Dude, thank you. Dude, it's not, stop and shop's not supposed to stop my day, dude. I don't know if there is a stop and shop in Worcester. I think it's all price chopper. Oh, right. Price yeah. chopper. Price chopper. They're next. Yeah. Price chopper's next. Well, we'll price chop you, son of a bitch. Going to a 347 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Ali from Astoria. Ali, what's going on? Oh, not much. Um, so a few weeks back, I went to a People's for Bernie event in Astoria. Yeah. Uh, I went there I went there when I was about 15% towards Warren, 85% uh, about Bernie. Uh, and it was awesome. There was a bunch of groups were out there, Millennials for Bernie, uh, I recognized a couple of outfits from the Amazon protest. And uh, long story short, I'm gonna, I joined the Queens of Bernie group. Uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of events. The Queen's going to be trying to lead some voter registration drives. And so I'm, I'm just trying to get people to check them out. Uh, vote for Bernie. Uh, he kicked ass in that Fox News thing. Uh, so just go out there, voter registration. Uh, look at our site. We're going to be doing a lot of events. I'm pretty excited. Great. Well, uh, good luck with it. Is there a website people can get more information? Uh, Queens for Bernie on uh, Facebook. And, uh, oh, one last thing. Uh, I saw some, a lot of my black and brown uh, brothers and sisters out there. Yeah. Uh, which makes uh, which makes sense. Bernie Sanders, uh, for, uh, in my view, is doing the most to address the issues uh, and get the excitement of our, our communities out here. There's a lot of immigrant other communities in Queens that are pretty excited about Bernie. Um, so I just want to throw that out there as well. Great. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Um, well, via Emerson Democratic primary poll yesterday, 53% of Bernie Sanders supporters uh, were black, Hispanic, Latinx, or Asian. 46% for Biden. 45% for Beto, 44% for Harris, 33% for Warren, 19% for Buttigieg. You don't say. Well, what a surprise. That cuts into the narrative a little bit, doesn't it? Hmm. Been telling you. Uh, how much are you willing to bet that that... Um, that, the, that those numbers will be broken down into uh, more specific numbers in communities till they find uh, one where he's losing. Yeah, but if you look at the critical Puerto Ricans over the age of 52 in Maryland who own Mercedes vote, I think it shows that he's not intersectional enough. JJ, cool. Do you guys know why Tulsi fans are insane? I've argued with plenty of people about why Bernie is the best, but Tulsi people ignore gravity before conceding an inch. By the way, Junior Soprano would be against tracksuits. Some of them Hip are bots. Hypnotic jeans. Yeah. Great interview today, Sam. There's a great video posted by a YouTube channel, Innuendo Studios, named There's Always a Bigger Fish. That touches on some of the same points from your interview. I highly suggest you check it out. There's always a bigger fish. Always a bigger fish. Uh, innuendo Studios. Okay. Smoot Court. Matt, I'll absolutely listen to the whole show, but can you briefly explain the reference to the wild uh, uh, 
to wild believing philanthropy is a joke. I mean, it's a pretty common critique of philanthropy that it just sort of covers up. Um, it, it's just sort of a bandage on a, pro- a systemic problem. It's letting a little air out of the tires. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Guida Nera, heard your discussion on Pelosi yesterday. I think Michael had it right. She's misreading the room and believes she is still, in her heart of hearts, a progressive. She just can't get past the fear of being called progressive as the new liberal is a bad word politics from the last 40 years since Reagan. Not great politics, nor wise understanding of the energy of the party, like you, uh, like you said. That said, she seems to be slow walking them forward, at least by putting them on heavy duty committees where they have the opportunity to have those big moments you guys have played in the last few weeks. She put them in a uh, visible position and have been rocking it. It, it. There may be some truth to that. Uh, if she isn't saying one thing in public and another behind the scenes, which is at best under 50 percent possibility, she's wounding the party severely. Swalwell is my rep. He's better than that clip showed. I've talked to him and he's uh, talked about Medicare for all and wouldn't do a uh, and wouldn't do a gay joke. He's in the Bay Area. But, yeah, he's got no chance. I'm not sure about what that means. Todd from Nova Scotia. Do you guys know who Barrett Brown is? Yes. In fact, I interviewed Barrett when he was in prison. He's been on Twitter ranting and raving about the intercept closing the Snowden files. Yes, it seems like he's trying to say something important, but he's very erratic in doing so. No one else seems to be talking about it. Any insight on this? I, I've been following his Twitter stuff, and he is being a little bit cryptic. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to keep looking into it. We may have him on. Uh, it's not just the Snowden files. There's other stuff going on, too. Well, Mark Ames had the critique years ago that, that those things should be treated in an open source fashion and not as part of like a company's business launch. There I don't was know if a that's what he's Twitter. There was a Twitter. Uh, there was a Twitter uh, guy, uh, Tar Tarzi. I can't remember his name now. Who was um, who was on that beat? Um, seemed like an odd uh, fellow, uh, but. I think there was, you know, th- th- that critique that the Snowden files were um, monetized a little too heavily, uh, I-, I-, I think had some, you know, at least a- as, a- as-, as a point of discussion, some merit. Uh, Rancid Tarzi, if I remember correctly now. I don't know. Uh, I have not seen Hide Nord Hair for a while, but... Um, William F. Cuckley, the Rhode Island fan, should check out Matt Brown, who recently lost the governor race to uh, Raimondo. He was absolutely a strong progressive. He worked with Justice Dems, AOC campaign alumni, and his work with nonprofit Global Zero lay foundation for the Iran deal. Also, check out Providence DSA campaign for energy justice. The archaic, under Medicare for All, would private for-profit hospitals also switch to a public system? Sink the insurance companies all you want, but Medicare for All can only work if hospitals are publicly owned too, question mark? Or is that negligible in the grand scheme? Rooting for you from Canada. I, I'm not, I mean, I personally don't feel that you need to get rid of private insurance. I, I just don't think that it's necessary to do what uh, you want to do. I, I think you... Um, I think there's going to be, I think there's room for them, you know, supplemental. Um, but if, you make people not require or like need it. Exactly. But I think there's going to be always a market for private insurance. I think there's going to be a market for concierge uh, doctors and some private hospitals and this and that. And I have no problem with that coexisting as long as it's some type of add on feature and it will be heavily, extremely expensive uh, and not. Um, not within reach so, uh, of, of most people so that it will not undercut the ability, um, you know, for a, a good public system to exist. I mean, I, I sort of perceive it like uh, a little bit like um, like public and private schools. I don't care that there's private schools. People want to send their kids to private schools. God bless. What I do care about is taking money from the public education system and giving it to private schools and giving it to uh, parochial schools. Um, I mean, that that system does not bother me as long as the public system is properly funded. People want to pay extra for as long as they have that money and we don't have a wealth tax that's making it (laughs) possible for you to do that. 
by all means, go ahead. But I think part of the question too was, should we move to having public hospitals, right? Because that's not part of the plan as of now that's being introduced. I, I mean, I think that maybe once you get the insurance down uh, and you, you've racked up that system, then I think it's time to start to look at that stuff. I, I don't know if it's necessary or not. Um, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot less uh, examples of, of that than there is a single payer system. You know, virtually every Western uh, industrialized nation has some form of a public uh, single payer system. The number of like government run health care delivery um, systems is much less. Right. You see it in the UK. Yeah, NHS. I, I would just want to add really briefly, if you're going to think more about going into other areas of the healthcare system to make fully public, I'd be interested in the pharmaceutical industry much more than eliminating all uh, private hospitals or insurance. West Coast comrade, late stage capitalist businessman Sam Cedar nimbly exploits the human capital of his flexible and passionate support staff. This is how the majority report can be so creative and innovative. Doe link. Read Marcy Wheeler's How to Read the Mueller Report. She's been tangling with trolls, but she's been providing lots of detailed info. Wheeler's suggestion on reading the report, don't jump to conclusions, read the whole thing, read the footnotes, ignore TV for 24 hours. Gregory from Oklahoma, a Democratic state representative from here in Oklahoma, tweeted that Bernie and Trump were basically the same, except for a few policy positions, and he got ratioed. His name is Representative Jason Dunnington. You sure it's not Jason Dummington? <laughs> Owned. Nice. All right. One more. Uh, given yourself a show for that. Final phone call of the day. I'm sorry, folks. We have a lot of people who have been hanging on for 104 minutes. Here is the 104.5 minutes, I assume. Calling from a 614 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Dan from Columbus, Ohio. Dan from Columbus, Ohio. What's on your mind? Okay. So. I am from, you know, what everyone recognizes as the penultimate swing state of Ohio, correct? If you say so, I don't know if it will be anymore. You could have gone uh, full red, but go ahead. That's true. Well, I am challenging this assertion from many that Ohio is no longer a swing state. And the reason why is because we have a situation in Ohio where the county parties and the urban centers have a lot of power over the state party, Right. And so we, we have this problem where um, the state party oftentimes chooses god-awful candidates and the, the county parties chose somebody who was much better uh, than the state party. And then you have the reverse effect where the county parties often choose candidates at a more local level, which are terrible in comparison to the state party's local candidates. And I would say in order for Ohio politics to get better, it's that so the, the two sides to this, the county parties and the state parties, they need to have a better synchronization on which candidates they actually endorse or ultimately not even involve themselves in the primary with the sample ballots, which is what they do now. So honestly, the main problem for Ohio Democrats, at least from my view, and I'm in contact with a lot of local progressive action groups and others, and that is, okay. And that is essentially like the conclusion is that's the problem, right? Well, um, I mean, I don't know enough about Ohio politics, but that sounds like um, if what you're saying is correct, that that would be a problem without a doubt. Um, and I, I, how do you do what you're talking about? Well, okay, so... You, I remember a while back you had um, the 12th Congressional District uh, debate on your show with Danny O'Connor versus Toy Balderson and their whole debate over the Affordable Care Act. And the 12th District is a great example of this because what occurred was that a lot of people at in Columbus, in the State House, and at ODP, there was a candidate in the primary for the Democrats named John Russell. And he was actually a Justice Democrat. He was a farmer from Galena, which is a more rural part of the district. And this district is like half rural, half urban. And he was also educated at Cornell, and he was, he was very good at connecting with the more rural voters. 
And so this is the guy that ODP and a lot of people in the state house liked and thought was the best choice. But the Franklin County Democratic Party, which is the county party for Columbus, which is the largest city in Ohio, they ultimately decided to endorse Danny O'Connor, who is the Franklin County recorder. Right, right. And he was, yes, he was chosen um, to run against the previous recorder who did not endorse the current mayor of Columbus. Okay. And... This guy is like, but but you know, without Carter getting it, was, it, you're getting you're getting too too much into the weeds, right? You know this stuff. We have yeah, no yeah. idea oh, what yeah, you're sorry. talking about. So just like broadly speaking, I'm just explaining what is broadly speaking. But this is just structural. What is the structural change you would make to get to get to where you want to get to? Honestly, I would say that what they need to do is to just get rid of the sample ballots at the local like county party level and the state party needs to stay out of the state primaries and ultimately let the candidates go around the state campaign and then win the primary in that way instead of the whole backroom deals kind of thing which is what we have now and ultimately like it loses us congressional races and it loses us statewide Fair races enough. because they do this the idea is more democracy right essentially yes and and like the gubernatorial right. primary, we had Cordray. Sorry, I know, I'm getting the weeds, but no, I know. But all right, but I think that's a good point, and I appreciate the call, Dan. And if there's anybody uh, listening who is involved in Ohio politics, I think Dan has a good point. And if you're not involved in Ohio politics, get involved in Ohio politics. This is where states, you know, Ohio may not be uh, the swing state anymore. Hard to know. But, you know, there are states in that area, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio. You get involved and you're going to have an outside influence, uh, outsized influence in the future of the country. That's just the case. All right. That's it for uh, calls today. I'm sorry, folks. We had uh, a ton of calls, obviously. And I'm going to read a couple of IMs and then we're going to go away. Pajama Boy. Can't say this is the case for a lot of people, but my sister, who is center-left, was massively impressed with Bernie's Fox Town Hall and is now much more open to him. I wonder if he was able to change some regular Fox viewers' minds, too. He killed it last night. I love Sarah Palin. As a capitalist, I'm reassured by Bernie's taxes and would be happy to vote for him. It's not about the million or so he's made. It's about the distribution. In the current state of the economy, we don't need a businessman like Trump. We need a conglomerate like uh, Bernie, and the left needs to respect Bernie's conglomerate. Sam, I don't think you did a poor job with that last caller from yesterday. America is still American. I think we need to do better answer on how to immigration benefits the U.S. Because a lot of people just see immigration legal and illegal as importing their competition. Episode uh, 31 of the Antifada. Episode 31 of the Antifada. Um, street legal. That Fox News town hall has me really wanting to see Bernie uh, debating Trump. Lazy Taco, the most impressive thing for me from Bernie's town hall was Peter Dow's reaction. He got on Twitter after the town hall and shot off an entire thread in support of Bernie. I was shook. I, I saw the reverberations of that uh, on Twitter. I didn't know what exactly Peter it was. Peter Dow's been getting on the good side for a while now. Nick from Manitoba. Hey, Sam, great interview today, sir. Great discor discourses on nonsensical political analysis. I felt like I was reading J.G.A. Pocock. Am I right? Lastly, Michael, what does uh, Bumba clot mean thank you i don't know what that means meta flight uh Buttigieg mentioned national service has a proposal has me thinking what exactly is the logic behind the idea that job guarantee is somehow harder to be co-opted to undermine the the welfare state than ubi is how is the job guarantee not functionally just a means tested guaranteed income with a ro work requirement with the biggest difference from work for fair being the fact that you always get a job if you want one Additionally, the job guarantee proposals I've seen boast about money being saved on other social services and mention the possibility of delivering benefits with one, like paid parental leave. Um, I don't think a job guarantee... I mean, I guess he, I see your point. You, you basically could be putting uh, restrictions on welfare. I got to think about that more. Chappie. Mondale said I'd raise your taxes, and so will Reagan. The difference is he won't tell you that. Butters, 17. Is there any chance Fox is willing to elevate Bernie because Fox and Trump believe that Bernie will be the easiest candidate to beat, even though they would be 100% wrong? It's conceivable, but, I mean, sometimes that backfires. Like, if you were to go all the way back in history to 2016, sometimes that theory can backfire. 
Daryl Perry returns. Say it, Sam. I want you to say kick, push, push, kick, push, coast, and away we roll. Just rebels to the world with no place to go. And the final I am of the day. Sam Snuff Stash. How can they say the audience was stacked? Don't underestimate the conspiracy theorist. Russia's paying Fox to build up Bernie against the Democrats because he's a socialist. Okay, so folks, see you tomorrow, I think. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. The truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid I guess I lost my drive.